Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Vice President Gabe Albernaz, and it is my honor uh, to have the opportunity to present a proclamation this afternoon uh, recognizing Cancer Survivor Awareness Month. We have two speakers who we will hear from shortly, but I was recently at an event uh, in which uh, we were asked everybody who has been impacted by cancer, somebody in their family, please raise their hand. Uh, and there wasn't a single person at the event that I was at that did not, in fact, raise their hand. Uh, this has impacted my, my family directly and so many other thousands of families, hundreds of thousands, millions of families worldwide. And we all get tremendous strength from our cancer survivors. Uh, we get tremendous knowledge. We get tremendous strength and, and really uh, there are uh, some pretty remarkable examples of that uh, and, and a good friend of mine who we're going to hear from in just a little bit. Um, but first, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Ms. Shelley Fulneso, uh, the CEO of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. And I invite her to provide some remarks now. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President Albernos, and um, thank you for to the entire council for this proclamation and for recognizing um, cancer survivors in this in this way. Uh, the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship is a nationally based organization, but we are right here in Montgomery County, and our founders. This year, we're celebrating our 35th year. And when our founders got together 35 years ago, people who had a cancer diagnosis were still considered victims. And they decided to change the lexicon and really think of them as survivors. And the wording in the proclamation uh, really came from our founders who said that people are cancer survivors from the day of diagnosis. And as we all know, or we're all touched by cancer in some way. Cancer um, affects the entire family. And cancer survivors, even when they complete treatment, are left with physical, emotional, and financial burdens for a long time to come. We are grateful that so many people are living longer after a cancer diagnosis due to incredible research advances. Um, but it's important to recognize that that toll that cancer takes on people even after they've completed treatment. They're grateful to survive, but they have the collateral damage of their treatments. And we are here to support cancer survivors and their families and to advocate on behalf of them for public policies to make cancer care better for everyone touched by cancer. Thank you so much for recognizing this month and for inviting me to join you. I really appreciate it. Shelley, thank you for those powerful words and the words uh, and, and the work of your remarkable organization and your leadership in particular, which has been so important. Thank you. Um, next, I want to introduce a good friend of mine, uh, State's Attorney John McCarthy. Uh, John and I met uh, actually in the living room of my aunt's house, who used to work with him in the state's attorney's office almost 20 years ago, uh, when John was working hard as a state's attorney to address the gang issue, uh, which had risen in Montgomery County. Uh, I was immediately impressed by both his energy, uh, his enthusiasm, his willingness to listen. Uh, and it just was obvious to me that we had a tremendous public official here uh, who is on the rise and really interested, invested in supporting our community. Um, all of us were devastated to hear the news some years ago that John was diagnosed with cancer, but none of us were surprised uh, at the manner in which he tackled cancer full on in the same way he tackles the courtroom, in the same way he tackles as a point guard playing basketball with his friends and community. Uh, so John, thank you uh, for your continued leadership. Congratulations on uh, being in remission now twice. We're all praying that you continue to have great health. Uh, and just thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And with that, John, please say a few words. Uh, Gabe, it's an honor to be with you, my friend. Uh, may, may I say my, the, the admiration I hold for you is is the same. I, we have a great friendship and, a, and I've worked many years uh, uh, with you on a variety of things back when you were at recreation, working with youth in this community. And uh, I want to thank you for your service. Look, I, I, I want to tell you, I have a lot of people to be thankful uh, to. Uh, I know uh, uh, Susan Kennedy, Mike uh, from C Community Television here in Montgomery County, who came in here uh, to interview me about what happened uh, with my cancer. And I've been through the surgeries and the chemo and the radiation. And I will tell you, uh, uh, I want to, I, I'm honored to be here with Shelly, uh, who has brought people together who have beat this thing because it really does have an emotional up and down. And I think uh, 
I think I'm sure that Shelly joins me in saying what, what we want to say to people who live in, uh, in the Washington area. First of all, you're very lucky. We have great researchers. We have great doctors. We have great therapists. We have great people here to help you. We want you to be proactive in addressing your cancer. We want you to be positive in addressing your cancer. Uh, what it takes, it takes a village. It takes a lot of friends for those of us because of their, our emotional roller coasters. Uh, having the love and support of people that are your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues is absolutely essential to beating this thing. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to say, based on the research that's being done in the area of cancer, every day you survive, you are a day closer to the cure. Uh, Shelly knows this, and I think she alluded to it. There are many young people and many, many people, just not all young, that have provided and allowed themselves to be part of uh, studies for cancer that have created cures that have allowed people like myself to be alive. And many of the people who might, might see this, your loved ones are alive because of the sacrifices of people like Andrew Lee, who lived down there in Silver Spring, who started the program Drive for the Cure that raised a half a million dollars for cancer research. And he participated in, in a lot of programs. I have a lot of personal heroes. I owe uh, a lot to many people. I think everybody who survived has been through this, tries to pay it back and help others. Uh, I meet people now that get referred to me that have the same surgeons, the same doctors, and we sit and talk about it. And I just try to encourage them say, you can, you can beat this thing. You can do it. Not every day is gonna be perfect, but you can make, you can regain your life and live a wonderful life. And I, I just want to thank, thank the county council uh, for, for uh, again, raising awareness about cancer and what it means to survive and how we need to come together as a community to help people meeting this challenge. Because Gabe, as you pointed out, it's everywhere. And no family probably goes untouched by cancer in some way. And that's kind of a sad thing, but each day you survive, you're a day closer to the cure. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be with you. Thank you, John. Extraordinarily well said. So now it gives me great pleasure uh, to read a proclamation of the Montgomery County Council. Uh, Whereas cancer has a major impact in communities across the United States and around the world, it is, it is estimated that 1.8 million new cases of cancer will be diagnosed nationwide and approximately 34,000 new cases will be diagnosed in Maryland. However, to date, nearly 17 million people in the United States are cancer survivors who are undergoing treatment, living through the challenge and thriving beyond their disease. And whereas in 2020, some of the most common cancers were breast cancer, lung and uh, bronchus cancer, prostate cancer, colon and rectal cancer, uh, melanoma of the skin, not Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, endometrial, cancer leukemia, pancreatic cancer, thyroid cancer, and liver cancer. In men, sorry, in men, prostate, lung, and colorectal cancers account for an estimated 43% of newly diagnosed cases. And for women, breast, lung, and colorectal cancers account for an estimated 50% of newly diagnosed cases. And whereas an individual is considered a cancer survivor from the time of diagnosis and through the balance of his or her life, every survivorship experience is unique as challenges <clears throat> may arise during and after treatments. However, surviving the, challenge, the, the challenges cancer presents is truly valiant. And whereas Cancer survivorship is often accompanied by new physical, emotional, and financial hardships and become quite challenging and isolating as cancer survivors adjust to their new normal. However, early and proper detection, providing life-saving treatments and affording ongoing care and mental health support systems help survivors heal from this chronic disease. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Council hereby recognizes Cancer Survivor Awareness Month and be it further resolved that the County Council honors all cancer survivors for their bravery and resilience and their families, medical specialists, caretakers, and cancer researchers for their commitment to ensure the well-being of our county residents and all those direct, directly impacted by cancer. Uh, presented on this 29th day of June in the year 2021, signed by myself and our Council President, Tom Hucker. Thank you again so much, Shelley and John. Keep up the good fight. Look forward to seeing you both soon. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.
Council, so I think we can begin uh, resume with item six, public hearing on expedited bill 2221, eating and drinking establishments, itinerant food service facilities amendments. Action is scheduled for later on in the meeting on item 19C. Um, if you'd like to follow the progress of a council bill, the council website has a subscribe function. You go to the website and use the view council records and legislative updates link to learn how. Each individual will have two minutes to speak. Individuals will be alerted as they approach their two minutes and may be disconnected. Also, there may be technical glitches during the public hearing. Um, there are no Mr. speakers. President, this is uh, Sydney. Uh, they won't let me start my video. So if you could, there, now I got it. Okay, thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, Cat Council Member Katz, great. Okay, there are no speakers for this hearing. Um, Council Member Katz, do you have anything? No, no, I just, thank you. I just want to start my video. Right, you bet. Um, okay. We're glad to have you. Um, and the public hearing is now closed. Um, item seven is a public hearing on expedited bill 2321, special capital improvements project, full upgrade of existing recycling center complex. This bill would authorize the planning, design, and construction of the full upgrade of existing recycling center complex project in the Rockville area. Action is also scheduled later in the meeting. There are no speakers for this hearing and the public hearing is now closed. Item eight is a public hearing in action on a special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget in the amount of 91950000 for American Rescue Plan Act non-departmental account. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this hearing. The public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this special appropriation? So moved. Council Member Wright moves and Council Member Navarro seconds. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among those present. Um, Next item nine is a public hearing and action on a special appropriation to Montgomery County Public Schools FY21 capital budget and amendment to the FY21 to 26 capital improvements program in the amount of $1,815,267 for the technology modernization project. Action is scheduled, scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this hearing either. The public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve the special appropriation? Chairman Rice? So moved. Second. Second. Councilmember Novato seconds. All those in favor of this special appropriation, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among those present. Great. Item 10 is a public hearing on a resolution to grant a franchise to new singular wireless PCS LLC to use the public right of way. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are two speakers for the public hearing. Ms. Kennedy, could you please call on the first speaker? Good afternoon. Yes, our, our first speaker this afternoon is Robert Janku. Mr. Janku, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin as soon as you're ready. Robert Janku speaking. We are in support of equitable access to the internet for all. We believe a functional equivalent access to the internet can be achieved without cell tires in residential rights of way. Nearly all claims being made about 1907 are fairy tales. No evidence is presented. No requirements for action are in 1907. What business theory says telecoms will add service to underserved communities when they haven't already done it? It's been scientifically proven that wireless radiation harms people. Talk to scientists, not lobbyists. Read the literature. NIH has done studies. Don't believe FDA, uh, this false re rejection. How will you feel ethically and morally when it's accepted that people have become sick and died because you did not do your due diligence? Let's have a hearing. Do you wish to bet your political career on DC appeals court saying this summer that FCC exposure limits are not scientifically valid as a result of EH trust suit. MoCo residents never finding out about the health effects have done no equity review when you say you are doing it for equity. Navarro's bill ramming this legislation through 
during a pandemic when people are distracted, siding with the telecom industry's bogus claims. Be safe. Don't jeopardize your political career. Do a fair review. I've studied this issue for five years. Lawyer Andrew Campanelli, the second district court in New York has rejected FCC's material inhibition standard. Likewise, according to lawyer Scott McCullough, the second circuit court of appeals in Portland case has rejected the FCC's material inhibition. Uh, please do your due diligence. Look into this. Don't believe lobbyists. Don't believe the sponsor of this Mr. bill. Chen I know Kuh, this I'm is so hard sorry to, to interrupt, but your time is up. Thank you so much for your testimony. We appreciate it. Our next speaker for the public hearing is Mark Graham. Mr. Graham, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yes, we can. All right. Um, good afternoon, uh, Council President Hucker, Council members and staff. My name is Mark Graham, representing Keep Cell Antennas Away. I do not live in Montgomery County, but I do have friends there. Please ask me questions after my presentation is over. I agree with what Robert Jenku said. Um, I sent you yesterday an email regarding with my specific points of objection to this uh, proposed uh, franchise. I hope that you've all received it and read it. I incorporate that letter and all those arguments into this uh, comment to my testimony right now. Now, I'm going to quickly go through most of them and then focus on the one I want to spend the most time on, which is the first one. But as you've read it, hopefully what you would you will have seen um, the following. Where is it? Come on. Um, the, the executive never made a recommend, recommendation to the council that included findings about the value of the franchise. That's number two. Um, you should amend the franchise to bring it into compliance with the Communications Act of 1934, Section 324, on the use of minimum power. That's number three. Um, number four, the franchise should be amended to exclude residential zones. And I cited case law from a recent appellate court decision that the council has the authority to do that. That's number four. Uh, number five is uh, an excellent section must be retained. And number six, finally, the, the notice that was published in the Washington, Washington Times was inadequate, and therefore you're not uh, prepared to proceed with this uh, franchise agreement today. But the, the thing I want to spend the most time on is the first point I made. Um, the, you did, the executive did receive at least a comment, probably several, about this proposed franchise, and you have failed to hold the required hearing. And because of that, you cannot proceed by approving this franchise today. It would be a violation of what I, the code that I described in my email. Natalie Prosser wrote to the county executive, Debbie Spielberg, and Mitzi Herrera, March 18, 2021, with questions and comments and objections regarding cell antenna policy, a municipal telecommunications policy. She was talking specifically about two things, insurance, what types of insurance are acceptable and unacceptable, and also a setback of 30 feet. So Mr. Graham, objecting. I'm sorry to interrupt, but your time is up. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. President, that wraps All up right. the speakers. Um, thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, okay, the public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Councilmember Rice moves. Second. Councilmember Reamer seconds. All those in favor of the resolution, please raise your hand. That's unanimous among those present. Okay. Uh, public hearing action. Uh, item 11 is public hearing and action on, the sub on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY21 and operating budget for the Department of Finance Economic Development Fund in the amount of $500,000 for the Fox Television Stations uh, LLC. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for the hearing. Public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve the supplemental appropriation? It's like that's that for like that's that. Like that's that. Like that. Mr. Smith, no, anything to add? Wait, okay. are you asking for a motion? No. I did ask for a motion. So moved. Councilmember Reamer moves. Councilmember Freeds and seconds. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among those present. Great. 
Item 12 is a public hearing and action on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY21 capital budget and amendment to the FY21 to 26 capital improvements program in the amount of $81,622 for facility planning storm drains. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers. Public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this supplemental appropriation? So moved. Councilmember Friedson moves. Second. Second. Councilmember Glass seconds. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among those present. Great. Item number 13 is a public hearing on a special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget in the amount of $1,473,388 for COVID-19 human services and community assistance non-departmental account for Nuestra Salud y Bienestar. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this hearing. The public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this special appropriation? So moved. Councilmember Reamer moves. Council second. Second. Councilmember Glass seconds. Great. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among those present. Item 14 is this public hearing and action on a special appropriation of the county government's FY21 operating budget COVID-19 human services and community assistance non-departmental account in the amount of $1,783,000 for COVID-19 response Montgomery County Food Security Fund. Action is scheduled immediately following this public hearing. There are no speakers. The public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this special appropriation? So moved. Councilmember Rice moves. Second. Councilmember Friedson seconds. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among those present. Great. Um, thank you. Item 15 is a public hearing and action on a supplemental appropriation to the FY21 operating budget for Montgomery County Government Department of Transportation, enhanced mobility of seniors and individuals with disabilities in the amount of $693,526. Action is scheduled immediately after this hearing. There are two speakers. Ms. Kennedy, could you please call on the first speaker? Our first speaker for this public hearing is Seth Morgan. Mr. Morgan, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Seth Morgan. I'm the chairman of the Commission on People with Disabilities and we are in opposition of this uh, uh, proposal. Uh, we have seen a pattern with uh, DOT in this county uh, wherein uh, uh, plans and designs are made and only uh, after they have been implemented uh, in some fashion is there any thought put to uh, asking people with disabilities for their input on this issue. Uh, I would go back to the history of the TSIF. Uh, it was originally uh, established for the purpose of increasing accessible vehicle rides in the county in direct response to the uh, influx of uh, Lyft and Uber into the county uh, who, that do not provide accessible vehicles. The number of taxis that uh, provided uh, such services decreased uh, markedly. Uh, and the fund was originally designed to allow uh, uh, funds to be uh, provided to uh, those drivers and companies that were willing to increase accessible uh, uh, rides. Um, and and it, the history of the TSIF is that no one seems to ever be able to find a way to use the funds for the original purpose uh, that it were, they were established for, by the way, by the Commission on Aging and the Commission on People with Disabilities uh, request. Uh, the uh, issue uh, is one of uh, DOTs in, in control of the fund. Uh, and at the end of the uh, fiscal year, they say, oh, wow, we couldn't figure out how to use this. And then they come up with ideas of how to spend the money. Uh, I know many drivers uh, who provide services to people with disabilities who are willing and able to uh, use the funds if they were offered to them. Uh, and I find it uh, very self-serving for them to say, we can't figure out how to use it. So let's use it for something else in our department. Uh, it is, uh, it is, we need someone who is a specialist in disabilities to be involved in the issue of uh, use of that fund. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Our next speaker is Cindy Buddington. Ms. Buddington, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Again, my name is Cindy Buddington. Um, I'm disabled. I use an electric wheelchair. Um, I use public transportation. And I um, 
I used to drive, I no longer drive. And, uh, or, and I now, I also use Metro Access, so a little background on me. I am also against using the TSIF funds for the uh, train people how to use the buses. Um, I use the buses. So again, the fund was supposed to be used to increase the number of accessible cabs on the road. And um, the cabs are going away and trying to get a successful cab is literally impossible. That's why we set up this fund. Now, just before I use up my two minutes, you know, I would like to, I'd be happy to talk with you or staff, your staff, and be able to explain in more detail the need for accessible cab, more accessible cab on the road to meet the needs of the disability community. So please feel free uh, to call me and we can have more time to talk and answer uh, questions. So this came up to me personally many years ago. Uh, my wheelchair broke down and I needed to get home. Uh, I needed to call a cab. So I called at least four more cab companies. No, and they all, every one of them told me they had no accessible cabs on the road at that time. Miss Buddington, um, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but your time is up. Thank you so much you. for your testimony. Okay, call me. Thank you. Mr. Thank President, you, Buddington. that wraps up the speakers for this public hearing. Colleagues, I'm so I'm, I gotta say, I'm surprised by this testimony and disappointed. And, and I'm gonna suggest we've, we've held our public hearing that uh, unless there's objection, why don't we hold off on taking action until we can talk to DOT and uh, find out about their outreach to this, our stakeholders. Without objection? Okay, great. No objection. I'm glad you're doing that. I think we ought to have some focus time maybe at TNA and we can delve back into this. It's been a persistent- It has. Shortcoming. Yes. Yes, absolutely. This has been going on for two and a half years. Um, okay, uh, this public hearing is now closed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Morgan and Ms. Buddington. Uh, next is our briefing on Vision Zero initiatives in uh, Montgomery County. Uh, I wanna welcome our colleagues from SHA, uh, DOT, MCPS, MCPD, and planning. And um, uh, of course the uh, um, the advisory commission as well. This is the first comprehensive update we're receiving since January 2020. We're excited to see how DOT and other partners are working to eliminate fatal and serious injuries on our county roads. Uh, we'll have updated statistics today on Vision Zero programs and an update on what has happened since our last briefing in 2020. Uh, let me turn it over to Dr. Orlin. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could take a step back just for a second to the last item, and I know you're not going to take it up today, but um, of that appropriation, 80% of it's being provided by a COG grant, and the concern seems to be for the 20% match. So an option you have is you could approve the appropriation, but instead of the match being from the Transportation Services Improvement Fund, that'd be from the general fund. And that would, uh, obviously, that would take money out of the general fund, $138,705, but it would uh, leave the uh, uh, improvement fund intact. And what I don't know is whether or not there's some kind of time pressure in terms of when this appropriation has to be approved to be able to take advantage of the grant. But uh, I can explore that in the next, you know, next week or so and okay. um, see, see what they say. So I just want to just point that out. Okay, um, Vision Zero. Uh, the last time we had a vision, the council on a Vision Zero briefing was in January of 2020. So it's been almost a year and a half. Uh, this spring, Council Member Glass is part of the uh, uh, the review of the operating budget did mention that he wanted to see the council have another briefing, an update on this, and this is what we've organized. Um, uh, and you mentioned, Mr. Hucker, the, the, the uh, items that will be covered. I just want to point out in terms of how this is going to work today, we have four presentations. Uh, the longest one will be from Wade Holland, the Vision Zero coordinator. 
uh, the PowerPoint that he's going to present and some attached slides to that, unfortunately, was not a, not available until late this morning. So it's out now as an addendum that you have it, but he's going to be walking through them uh, uh, live as well. Uh, and then I'll be followed by a briefing by the uh, State Highway Administration about their program that is in the packet, uh, followed by a shorter briefing by Park and Planning, very sh a very short briefing that's in the packet. And the fourth will be from Christy Daphnis, the uh, chair of the uh, uh, Pedestrian uh, Bicycle Safe uh, Traffic Safety Advisory Committee has a few comments she wants to make. And then it's open to questions from the council members. I do want to point out that we solicited from council members uh, ahead of time a lot of uh, any of your detailed questions about specific locations. And so in the packet, there's um, 15, 20 pages of questions and answers. Uh, the idea that uh, you have the answers now from the, hopefully the discussion today could, could revolve around the, the, the larger issues. And if you want to follow up with some of these smaller ones, uh, you have the data, you have the responses in the packet and you could, you could follow up from that. So with that, if, if that's uh, okay as a way of uh, going through this, uh, I would turn it over to uh, Wade Holland, Vision Zero Coordinator, to give his presentation. Wade, are you there? He, we did schedule this to start at two, so I would, well, it's almost two o'clock now, so. I thought my filibustering would have helped, but <laughs> apparently not. Um, He's not on the participant list. Could we start with one of the other presenters? Okay. Well, we can, if uh, Erica Rigby and uh, and uh, Derek um, and Luke are there for State Highway, we'll perhaps start with them. Hi, Dr. Orland. Matt Baker here from Maryland State oh, Highway. Matt. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Regional Hi, planning here Hi. in Baltimore. Um, I think I'm going to kick it off for our presentation, and then we're going to pitch it to our team in District 3. So let me see if I can share screen at the PowerPoint up here and we'll get going. Okay. Let me know if you all can see the PowerPoint. It's there. One sec. Okay. And this this is also circle one in your packet. Well, good afternoon, uh, Council President Hucker, Council Vice President Albernos, uh, and the whole council, of course. Uh, my name is Matt Baker. I am Regional Intermodal Planning Chief here at M.SHA. Um, uh, you'll be hearing, of course, from our county DOT partners here in a bit. Um, at M.SHA, we also are working hard to make Vision Zero a reality. Um, today we'll be taking, or I'll be talking to you about M.SHA's uh, Pedestrian Safety Action Plan, or, or what we often call the PSAP, a year-long initiative that began in April to develop strategies and identify projects uh, using safety data, public input, and expert analysis to improve bicycle and pedestrian safety along M.SHA's roadways in Montgomery County and throughout the state of Maryland. Our core initiative to push toward Vision Zero at M.SHA is called Context Driven. And that's a framework that is helping and will help M.SHA design and construct roadways appropriately for all users. Since Maryland officially adopted Vision Zero in 2019, M.SHA proactively has implemented over 200 context driven improvements throughout the state, many of which are in Montgomery County. Uh, the context driven framework has developed over that time into six individual components. First, M.SHA is moving forward with the development of a pedestrian safety action plan, as I mentioned, the PSAP, to better understand and coordinate where pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements are needed. Second, M.SHA finalized in 2019 our context-driven guide, with which some of you may be familiar, which identifies a range of contexts and the appropriate balance between access and mobility that roadway design should achieve in each of those contexts. Third, M.SHA is populating a context-driven toolkit that will help practitioners determine which treatments to design and construct in each context. Fourth, M.SHA is establishing a methodology to develop case studies that will track how these improvements are performing across the state. Fifth, 
M.SHA is building awareness within the agency throughout the state and even nationally of its implementation of context driven through both education and training. And finally, sixth, M.SHA has rolled out a one stop shop uh, online where its customers can and practitioners can access context driven resources as well as track our progress. So to review the purpose of the context-driven components, the context guide helps M.SHA define the context surrounding M.SHA roadways. The PSAP identifies needs, strategically planned projects, and targets investments. The toolkit provides the tools that M.SHA needs to appropriately change roadway design. Case studies show where and how these changes are making a difference. And training and investing in the people that are engineering safe roadways for all users makes this all possible. Now that we've covered con the context-driven framework, I want to talk about what a PSAP is and how it builds on that framework's foundation. The PSAP is going to outline step-by-step -step how M.SHA will improve pedestrian and bicycle safety by identifying our current challenges, setting our future goals and objectives, establishing priorities, and determining where M.SHA should focus its investments. It's important that the PSAP supports the engineering goals of Maryland's broader Strategic Highway Safety Plan, or SHSP. The SHSP covers a range of key elements to create a safer environment, including enforcement, education, and EMS. The fourth E, engineering, is where M.SHA can play a significant role. The PSAP prioritizes land use context and balances mobility and access to focus M.SHA on implementing projects that enhance safety for all users. To improve pedestrian safety, M.SHA has established goals that will get us there to coordinate, deliver, invest, and innovate. With this PSAP, M.SHA can better coordinate its agents with its agency partners here in Montgomery County and throughout Maryland to support pedestrian and bicycle safety programs. M.SHA also can direct investment where there are known safety challenges and concerns, and M.SHA can ensure that it delivers road improvements that foster context-driven objectives and leverage technology and innovation to improve pedestrian safety. So why does Maryland need a PSAP? Simply because one death on our roads is too many. Although total crashes involving pedestrians in Maryland decreased by 5% and total pedestrian injuries decreased by 7% from 2018 to 2019, and that's the most recent year of, uh, we have full data for, the total number of traffic fatalities during the same period increased by over 4% statewide. In 2019, one in four crashes in Maryland involved a pedestrian even the state with one of the highest fatality rates in the country. So the process for developing a PSAP includes the following. Data collection and analysis, using that data analysis to understand our existing conditions, identifying areas of need, prioritizing these needs within each M.SHA district office, defining the appropriate actions and strategies, and last, rolling that up into a final action plan. To get to that point, M.SHA has sought and will be seeking public input at various stages of the process. First, in order to understand the full picture of where Maryland stands today, M.SHA developed several surveys and a comment map to gather public input. M.SHA kicked off that element at an April 30th public meeting. In fact, while we collected uh, comments for the next month over the course of May, we actually ended up getting over 1,100 individual uh, comments on our comment map, so that was a really good success and we're really excited about that. After analyzing safety data, reviewing public input, and taking into account census data, M.SHA will be mapping existing conditions and then we'll touch base again to review areas of need with the public. This will include hosting a second public meeting in the summer or possibly the early fall of 2021. Then M.SHA will seek another round of public comment and input to help prioritize the needs identified. And finally, M.SHA will connect with the public once more to help identify necessary action steps to complete the final PTAP plan. Before I hand it over to my colleague, Joe Mogus, who's going to highlight some of the improvements already in place and underway here in Montgomery County, I wanted to let you all know a few ways you can get involved. First, get acquainted with our context-driven web portal, that one-stop shop I mentioned for everything we've discussed here today. From there, you can access the PSAP webpage for more information on the PSAP and coming activities. And you can also review the public input we received during our first round of input on the comment map. 
watch the latest home studio episode. That's a series of informative chats between M.SHA Administrator Tim Smith and Maryland Highway Safety Office Director Dr. Tim Kearns. As well, you can always contact us here at M.SHA. We have a dedicated email address for this effort specifically, SHA Context Guide at m.maryland.gov. Thank you again for your time. Uh, now, Eric Rigby, Derek Gunn, and Joe Mogus from M.SHA's District 3 office are going to walk you through some of the context-driven improvements M.SHA is deploying in Montgomery County. Joe. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to share my screen if possible. Sure. I can stop sharing. Give me one moment. And let me know if you mean me to pull back up the other one. I think we're good. Um, can you see my screen? I can. Okay. All right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, Council, Council President Hucker, and everyone in attendance. My name is Joseph Mogus. I'm a consultant project manager for M.SAJ District 3 traffic. At the district level, M.SHA is evaluating all appropriate pedestrian safety measures, as well as revisiting improvements previously implemented. Uh, in the new and ongoing efforts to meet our Vision Zero goals, we would like to present five aspects or tools with the council after this afternoon. As you can see on this slide, those are speed limit reductions, road narrowing, pedestrian signal and phasing modifications, pedestrian crosswalks, and last but not least, multimodal. As you can see in this slide, we have an image showing a snap. HA's context-driven treatments our context-driven guidelines work hand in hand with Vision Zero's goals. You may notice that among the improvements listed are enhanced visibility crosswalks, signals, signage and lighting, lane reduction or lane narrowing, bicycle and pedestrian improvements, bicycle lanes, and speed limit reductions. While this map is not a comprehensive list of all the improvements completed by M.SHA in the last year, it is helpful in understanding the scale of the accelerated efforts. On this slide, we have an image showing five sections of state roadway that we studied and found appropriate to reduce the speed limit. Those are Maryland 28 Norbeck Road from Maryland 115 Moncaster Mill Road to Bell Pre Road, which has been reduced to 35 miles per hour. Maryland 410 Philadelphia Avenue from Maryland 320 Piney Branch to Chicago Avenue has been reduced to 25 miles per hour. Maryland 119 Great Seneca Highway from Middlebrook Road to Maryland 117 Clapper Road has been reduced to 35 miles per hour. Maryland 396 Massachusetts Avenue from DC Line to Maryland 614 Goldsboro Road has been reduced to 30 miles per hour. And Maryland 355 Rockville Pike from Twinbrook Parkway to Mount Vernon Place has been reduced to 35 miles per hour. On this slide, we have an image showing two sections of the state roadway that we studied and found appropriate to narrow the lanes. Uh, this would be Maryland 97 Georgia Avenue from Maryland 185 Connecticut Avenue to Denley Road in the Wheaton Glenmont area, and Maryland 410 East West Highway from Maryland 185 Connecticut Avenue to Montgomery Lane in Bethesda. On this slide, we have four signing and phasing improvements implemented at various locations on state roadways in Montgomery County. First, you'll see no turn on red. This improvement eliminates right turning conflicts with pedestrians rightfully in a crosswalk. A notable new application of this would be Maryland 410 East-West Highway at Grubb Road. Next, you'll see turn traffic yields to PEDS. This improvement addresses right turn conflicts with pedestrians rightfully in a crosswalk when motors volume and operational safety are found to be justified and acceptable. Notable new applications of this would be Maryland 187 Old Georgetown Road at Tilden Lane, as well as Maryland 410 Philadelphia Avenue at Maryland 320 Piney Branch Road. Um, next, you'll see all-way stop control. This improvement addresses all intersection operation, operational conflicts, including motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists, where signalization may not necessarily be justified or warranted. A notable new application of this would be Maryland 192 Metropolitan Avenue at St. Paul Street. Lastly, you'll see lead pedestrian interval phasing. This improvement addresses left turning conflicts with pedestrians rightfully in crosswalk when motor volumes and operational safety are found to be justified and acceptable. Notable new applications of this would be Maryland 650 New Hampshire Avenue at Sligo Creek Parkway, Maryland 119 Great Seneca Highway at Richter Farm Road, and Maryland 193 University Boulevard at Maryland 320 Pine Branch Road. 
As you can see in this slide, we have an image showing four intersections on state roadway that we've studied and found appropriate to install pedestrian signals and beacons in Montgomery County. First, you'll see Maryland 97 George Avenue at Fenwick Lane in Silver Spring. Then we have Maryland 190 River Road at Pile Road, which is currently under construction. And we also have Maryland 355 Wisconsin Avenue at Avondale Street slash Commerce Lane in Bethesda, as well as Maryland 355 at Chase Avenue, also in Bethesda. We have implemented a statewide crosswalk safety upgrade to enhance visibility crosswalks or continental crosswalks, as we call them. We are utilizing a programmatic approach whereby these upgraded crosswalk markings are to be installed anytime the markings are disturbed. That may be by way of resurfacing, utility impacts, or perhaps even a developer project. That being said, we are also utilizing our own forces as well as contractors to install these crosswalk upgrades throughout the county to accelerate this effort. And now we turn to multimodal efforts. Uh, on this slide, you'll see M.SHA's recent lane repurposing project in order to install permanent bike lanes along Maryland 187 Old Georgetown Road from Cedar Lane to the Capitol Beltway. We have removed tripping hazards and signs obstructing the sidewalk. We repaired curbs and widened sidewalks to improve safety and mobility. We also reviewed pedestrian and bicycle safety concerns with agency members and elected officials and citizens. And last but not least, we have the Maryland 193 University Boulevard from Amherst Avenue to Arcola Avenue Shared Streets Project. The pilot program repurposed the rightmost lane along eastbound and westbound Maryland 193 within the subject section of subject section for bicyclists. The program allows for bicyclists to have a dedicated lane, whereby allowing pedestrians to effectively reclaim the sidewalk with a buffer from motors. By eliminating one of three lanes, the program would also have a vehicular traffic calming effect. Uh, the pilot segment improves bicyclist mobility to and from economic and population centers, as well as connectivity to existing recreational trail networks. The improvements were fully installed as of June 14, 2021. This project will be in place for four to six months, where we will be continually gathering data and assessing challenges and successes. Um, as you know, this stemmed from our previous project, which was the shared streets for outdoor dining during the COVID era. Uh, that concludes M.SHA's presentation, and I'd like to thank all of you for this time and your attention. Okay, if, uh, is Mr. Holland uh, available now? All right, I'm here. Okay. We jumped ahead to the State Highways presentation, uh, but we can come back, I think, now to yours. All right. Perfect. Let me uh, bring up the slide deck and we will get, all right, one second. And again, for the council members and those following at home, this is in the addendum for today's packet. All right. And you should be seeing a title slide now. Yes. Seriously. All right. Thanks for confirming, Glenn. Uh, good afternoon, council members, and thank you for holding us briefly on the Vision Zero program. My name is Wade Holland. I'm the Vision Zero coordinator for Montgomery County government, and we'll be leading this portion of our presentation for our recent projects and campaigns that have been completed since January 2020 when we last met. Uh, joining me for the question and answers will be Hannah Hen from the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, as well as uh, Captain Jim Brown and Lieutenant Mike Rowan from Montgomery County Police. Uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to keep a lot of our projects and campaigns close to the initial schedule, uh, despite some of all the headwinds that COVID presented to all aspects of, of life in 2020. The county and state have moved forward, as you saw in SHA's presentation, many numerous signal and beacon projects, as well as corridor projects that added protected bike facilities and narrow travel lanes to bring safer speeds and more safe speeds for the context of the communities that those roads go through. I wanna highlight a few of these initiatives in the presentation today, as well as additional details that are in the appendix of this slide deck will be um, in the packet, as well as on the Vision Zero website. So part of doing our work is always trying to find uh, more money to do more work, and that's through the grant process. I do wanna thank our colleagues at the State Highway Administration for a new grant opportunity that we're working on just before I got on this call, which was a new, grant to localities for the Highway Safety Improvement Program, um, which will provide us more opportunities to provide more safety projects and construction dollars uh, throughout the county. 
we've been successful with some recent projects uh, underway through regional, regional, state, and federal funding opportunities to include the new design guidance for urban navigation for people with vision impairment, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a, an upcoming section. Um, safety studies for Connecticut Avenue in the, for the city of Kensington, New Hampshire Avenue between the Beltway and Prince George's County, and even small grants that help our um, Safe Routes School Education campaign to provide free helmets and bike rodeo support. As SHA has mentioned their presentation, a big piece of bringing Vision Zero to a county context is trying to break up these blocks and provide more safe um, pedestrian crossings throughout the, the county. And as you can see, um, the areas that have a star in front of that, those are installed pedestrian hybrid beacons and signals. And then the ones without a star are in the queue. We, since the start of the Vision Zero 2018-2019 action plan, have installed 35 new signals and beacons. And again, have a couple dozen more in the queue across the county installed by SHA and the county. Um, recent online beacons include the Twinbrook Parkway at the Twinbrook Recreation Center near the city of Rockville, uh, Spring Street and First Street in downtown Silver Spring, as well as two beacons along Democracy Boulevard, which is also a high injury network road near Walter Johnson High School and the Davis Library. Next up in the queue to be installed are the three pedestrian hybrid beacon upgrades along Belpre Road between Georgia Avenue and Lay Hill Road. And since our last meeting in January 2020, of those 35, um, about 16 have been installed. So it's four new signals, four pedestrian hybrid beacons, as well as six pedestrian beacons. Looking at some of our corridor projects, we are making advancements across the county's high injury network. As we mentioned with SHA, they've been narrowing travel lanes and lowering the posted speed limits to better match the community context along major roads, such as Georgia Avenue and Wheaton and Glenmont, and University Boulevard between Wheaton, Glenmont, sorry, Wheaton, Kensington, and Silver Spring. We've repurposed general travel lanes and narrowed roads along Old Georgetown Road and Millbrook Road, the first being a state road, the latter being a county road, to provide dedicated space for people on bikes and provide a new buffered sidewalk for the existing sidewalks on those roads. Ongoing now is continuing the White Flint West Workaround Project, and that will provide a new street network in North Bethesda, as well as improving access between North Bethesda and the White Flint Metro Station. One of the parts of that project is removing all the high, hot right turn lanes at the intersection of Old Georgetown Road and Rockville Pike, as well as upgrading the sidewalks on Rockville Pike. I want to thank the council again for their support for Safe Routes to Schools and the additional funding for FY22. For this portion of the discussion, I want to talk about kind of two sides of Safe Routes to School and how they work in tandem to build safer connections to schools encouraging kids and parents to walk and bike using those upgraded facilities. So the first part is what we call our engineering side, which does walk audits and construction of those walk audits um, throughout the school walk sheds. So there's been two rounds. Uh, we completed round one a couple years ago, and that was to examine the frontage of all the county schools. So basically they are right in front of the schools. Round two, which is currently underway, examines um, kind of the walk shed as it's defined by Montgomery County Public Schools. And of the round two studies, um, 30 have been completed and 10 of those audits are completed. The, the construction has been completed for those audits. One note is the construction of those projects typically does not include the missing sidewalk elements, but does include things such as bump outs, new crosswalk markings, and you know, look, lowering the distance someone has to use to cross the road. So how will we be utilizing the extra uh, money during FY22 operating capital budgets? Um, so MCDOT will be able to perform a state, a system-wide sidewalk gap analysis for the MCPS walk sheds, do 10 additional studies and do three build outs for safe routes to schools. And while MCDOT works on a more detailed planning estimates for these sidewalk gaps, an initial look um, at the walk sheds shows a need somewhere between $100 and $350 million worth of sidewalk needs in these school walk sheds. And that's just to build on one side of the road for those gaps. And the other side is the education side. So even with school buildings closed throughout 2020, uh, the education side of Safe Routes School has kept busy. Some of the examples during 2020 that Safe Routes to Schools had was um, Virtual Safety Week, which is a week long uh, during May, 
to have different virtual campaigns and different activities each day for kids to learn about safe walking and biking in schools. There's Walking Wednesdays during October month, um, sponsored at school meal sites. And as kids started to go back to school buildings, uh, the Safe Routes Schools program developed a walking school bus toolkit to teach families and communities how to develop a walking school bus and also what a walking school bus is. And we'll continue to pr promote that um, when kids return to school in the fall. A Safe Routes School newsletter was also revived this spring, it includes safety information uh, tips, as well as updates on projects being done throughout the county around schools. A quick update on our work to make sure that our complete streets program is actually complete for everyone, including those with vision and mobility impairments getting across the county. So we have heard and are addressing concerns from people with vision and mobility impairments about crosswalk safety and about crossing newly installed bike lanes and floating bus stops. We work closer with the community, both cyclists and people with disabilities and people walking in those areas to discuss any challenges they have with current and future infrastructure, what we can do to help them safely navigate. Uh, the first piece of that is, as we mentioned earlier in the grant section, we had a grant from Washington Council of Governments to help us develop a new uh, guidelines. So this new guidance document will help roadway designers and its maintainers uh, better consider and elevate um, the considerations for people with visual impairment. Um, as part of the development of this new guidance, it will also develop a pilot location along Fenton Street in downtown Silver Spring to test out some new guidance and navigation tools for people with no and low vision to help them navigate a busy urban center and kind of using that pilot project to really determine what makes most sense for um, Montgomery County to help people with no and low vision navigate these busy and increasingly complex uh, urban centers. Regarding the floating bus stops, I did want to highlight that our floating bus stops, and this is kind of what I consider a 2.0 plus bus stop that's at the corner of Second Avenue and Colesville Road in downtown Silver Spring. So there's a number of safety features installed to get cyclists to yield to people crossing the bike lane, as well help help people with mobility impairments to reach the front of the bus to board. Some of the examples include a lateral deflection. So as you're approaching on your bike, you are forced to basically make a kind of a turning movement to stay on the bike lane. So when you have to make that movement, that slows you down, similar to a chicane for people on roadways. There is vertical deflection. So again, similar to a speed table or speed hump used on a road for cars. This is another way and a cue to get cyclists to slow down and yield as they approach the bike lane. Also, uh, marking slow as they enter the, the floating bus stops. And something that's not on this picture that has been added since then is rumble strips have been added to, again, help cyclists to slow down. And then further ahead in the picture, you can see the flex post in between the two bike lanes. So again, just as narrow, lane narrowing can slow cars down and it can also slow bicyclists down, as well as the green conflict paint to get um, cyclists to be aware that this is an area of conflict and everyone needs to be uh, careful and make sure they yield to pedestrians. So to provide safe access, we've also included detectable and guidance surfaces, which would be kind of the yellow bumpy domes um, in the front of the picture. We have level crossings, so you don't have to go up or down on this bus stop if you're crossing from the sidewalk to the floating bus stop. There's an orientation flex post to tell a person using a cane or other device when and where they need to turn to be at the front of the bus. There are railings to keep people walking or rolling off the sides of the floating bus stop. And there's also a straight path from the sidewalk to the front of the bus for people who need to use the uh, wheelchair ramp to get on the bus. So based on what we've heard from all the community members and throughout the pilot project, we developed a couple different next steps. So again, people with no and low vision noted that oncoming cyclists can be difficult to hear and perceive. They wanted to make sure they have a way to stop oncoming traffic, both for cars and bicyclists when they're crossing these facilities. So based on that feedback, MCDOT, whenever possible, will co-locate the floating bus stops with an audible pedestrian signal and a full traffic light. Um, they'll allow access to the bus stop and for crossing the intersection all kind of in one movement. The first of this kind of floating bus stop model will be at Montgomery Lane and East Lane next to the Bethesda Metro Station. In addition to that project and that new guidance, there will be the completion of the navigation and toolkit project that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, as well as building on top of that toolkit, updating the ADA guidance that we currently have on the books 
based on those feedback, and that will begin this fiscal year as well, and last into FY23. The uh, draft Vision Zero 2030 action plan was released April 15th of 2021, and we recently wrapped up our community feedback last week on the 21st, and so now we're starting to um, synthesize that feedback and start to make our final draft of the 2030 action plan. So the 2030 action plan was a three-phase process that started about a year ago on June 18th, 2020, um, with a community kickoff meeting, and that led to a kind of fact-finding mission for phase one. Was before we could even talk about the action items, talk about you know technical guidance and all that fun stuff. We really want to hear from the community what would, what did they want, what do they what makes them feel safe. We took all that feedback and had work groups that met throughout the fall and the winter, 2020 and 2021 that developed all of those um, objectives, strategies, and action items and performance metrics that you see in the current plan that was released in April. And I must mentioned a little earlier, we used that um, feedback we received uh, this spring, and we're certainly taking all that feedback right now and incorporating that into our final draft. And what do we hear from our community? So one thing that we did, we uh, actually had our, the work plan we approved with those kind of three phases approved, I think the week we all shut down for COVID. So we had to go back to the drawing board the week after and, and really rethink how we wanted to do um, building a plan that was also had equ equity at the center of it during a time of social isolation. So we were very explicit about how we did our outreach during COVID, especially during phase one, during the outreach. And one thing we did was we had these kind of resilience Montgomery listing sessions. So each of these sessions was for not only for the Vision Zero plan, but also for the Climate Action Plan to engage communities we know from the data, we know from prior feedback efforts that we don't hear from enough. So there were eight of those listening sessions, three which were in completely non-English languages, one in Spanish, one in Mandarin Chinese, and one completely in Amharic. And we also had a Resilience Montgomery Youth Ambassadors last summer, which we used the COVID core team. We had a group of teenagers that helped, and we trained them up on climate trained them up on Vision Zero and how to do community interviews. They also went out, interviewed, you know, their neighbors, their friends, their family to get feedback from those, again, traditionally underrepresented communities. We fed all that into our feedback and here's kind of the high level things of what we've heard so far from the community. So again, really just a desire to see more opportunities to be a safer pedestrian and a safer bicyclist through the facilities. It's so lacking all across the county. More sidewalks, especially sidewalks with space between the sidewalk and the roadway, more bike lanes, partic particularly more protected bike lanes, but also opportunities for recreational cycling on the trail network and connections to that trail network from neighborhoods. More opportunities for safer crossings, so more, as I mentioned earlier, more beacons, more traffic signals to break up that space between protected crossings. Safe bus stop access, you know, not having to walk, you know, mile out of your way to really get to the bus stop safely, having more safe crossings to and from every bus stop in the county. More communication, and especially more two-way communication, not only more easier to find information about projects, but also, you know, how are we collecting feedback? How often are we collecting feedback on projects? And how do people stay involved in different phases of the project's life? And we talked about the behavior of people on the road. There really was a lot of information we collected about driver behavior and particularly issues around speeding, especially during COVID for speeding was an issue and for drivers not yielding to pedestrians and cyclists. So this is a, a kind of a plan that's gonna lead us through this, co this coming decade, but to make sure it doesn't turn stale and sit on the shelf after the year we took to build it, we have kind of two plans we built at once. One was the kind of longer term plan, which is the 2030 action plan. Then underneath that, we've built a two year action plan to keep saying, here's the money we know we have, here's the resources we have, what can we do right now to start saving lives on our roadway? And that's where the two-year action plan comes into place. That will cover FY22 and 23. Again, the capital budget will update in 23. And when that new capital budget comes on in 23, that will again lead to another segment of planning in FY24 to make sure this plan is always transparent, accountable, and up-to-date and utilizing the latest practices and reflecting on what's working and what are challenges to make sure that the plan is always moving forward. A final note on the uh, 2030 action plan on this slide is how it's developed. 
This plan's organization has dropped the traditional safety ease and adopted areas recommended as part of a safe systems approach. These safe system approach areas were combined to create the three new pillars of Vision Zero in Montgomery County, which are complete streets, multimodal future, and culture of safety. So complete streets area includes what are safe streets and safe speeds. And so for there, we're focusing on, you know, how do we utilize our right of way to make sure however you want to get around, whether it's biking, walking, rolling, driving, purple line, all of the above, you can utilize the space and feel safe in that space. The multimodal future area, which includes safe transportation, safe and sustainable communities, and safe vehicles, is focused on how do you safely get to and from current and future um, tra tra travel and transportation options, developing communities that support safe streets and transit, as well as safe vehicles, particularly looking at um, how our county utilizes its own fleet to, to bring about safety. And finally, the third pillar is the culture of safety, which is the safe people and safe post-crash response and care. And that's focused on communication with communities most impacted by serious and fatal traffic crashes, as well as traffic enforcement. And a quick note on traffic safety enforcement. As we mentioned, uh, I've been talking about throughout the budget deliberation for the FY22 budget, the police chief's reorganization plan will go into effect July 5th. This will move traffic complaint officers into the central traffic unit to continue our rollout of the focus on the five program, the focus on the enforcement efforts against behaviors that are known to lead to deadly consequences on our roads. That includes distracted driving, not wearing a seatbelt, impaired driving, uh, exceeding the speed limits, and not yielding to pedestrians and cyclists. While this new plan has more centralized focus, there are still traffic complaint officers left at each of the districts to make sure that while we still have a more data-driven approach, there are still ways to make sure we can respond to community complaints as they arise. Some example of some recent high visibility enforcement, um, MCPD works with municipal and state police on joint safety initiatives. So just earlier this month, a joint initiative along, along Rockville Pike to curb aggressive driving, speeding and excessive noise brought up 42 citations, 101 warnings and 41 safety equipment repair orders with similar initiatives planned throughout the summer to curb all of those issues we've seen during the pandemic and continuing um, since then. Final part of the update are on crash statistics um, for 2020 and 2021 year to date. Uh, nationwide, there was an uptick in traffic fatalities despite much lower traffic volumes. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's analysis uh, shows the main behaviors that drove the increase include impaired driving, speeding and failure to wear a seatbelt, their initial data review of 2020 for nationwide statistics show occupant ejection deaths were up 20% compared to 2019, unrestrained occupants were up 15%, and alcohol involved was up 9%. Though I'd imagine that alcohol impairment number will go up as more toxicology reports come in. And that's something we very much saw in Montgomery County when we were monitoring the data throughout the pandemic. We called it our triple threat of no seatbelt, impaired, and very excessive speeds. So in 2020, there were 39 fatal crashes with 41 fatalities. This is the highest total since the 41 fatal crashes recorded in 2010. Uh, we saw increases for vehicle occupants, um, as well as pedestrians and people on foot. Although with pedestrians, there was quite an uptick actually in the pre-pandemic months of January and February. And then during the pandemic actually lowered more to, the, to these typical pre-pandemic average. Um, but again, pedestrian fatalities have been on the rise nationwide, and fortunately, we are not bucking those national trends. As I mentioned, nationwide, there's an issue with impaired driving, and we saw that very much so in Montgomery County. In any given year, about 30% of our traffic deaths involved at least one party who was impaired by alcohol, drugs, or both. In 2020, it was much higher than that 30%, 51%, or 20 of those 39 crashes involved one impaired party. And it was not just you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, we were seeing you know, 0 0.2, 0.22s. And those were, um, those were levels where you're basically starting to start to black out, losing consciousness, which is scary to think about someone behind the wheel with that level of um, alcohol in their system. So when we talk about Vision Zero, it's really talking about serious and fatal crashes together. And that's where we make our targets on. Um, those went down, again, mostly because of serious crashes declining. So we saw declines across all 
injury categories one through four, but not for five, which are fatalities. So overall, there was a decline of 26% for serious and fatal crashes combined compared to 2019. Large decline was for people on foot, uh, pedestrians with a 33% decline, followed by people in motor vehicles at 23%. Um, for some year to date numbers, uh, we have about 88 serious injuries so far, which is about 24% below average. And we've had 12 fatal crashes with 15 people killed. Three of those are pedestrians, two in motorcycles, and then the rest either drivers or passengers. But again, thank you for your support in Vision Zero. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Dr. Orland. Uh, next would be uh, Casey Anderson from the Planning Board. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, we have done a lot of work and put a lot of time, uh, effort, and resources into Vision Zero in both the Planning and the Parks Department. Uh, if we could see the next slide, it's a reminder of some of the work that we've done over the last few years with your support, starting about three. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Rowland, can I just ask at the beginning, how long are the next two presentations? I just want to make sure we stay on schedule and have enough time for colleagues' questions. They're short. I think total maybe five or six minutes. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you. Uh, so about four years ago, you approved the Bicycle Master Plan, which really laid the groundwork for our ongoing the pedestrian master plan, which is really the first of its kind, I think, in the entire uh, country and is, will be the state of the practice. And Jesse will tell you a little bit more in, the, in a minute. Uh, also, every single one of our master plans uh, for land use now includes a Vision Zero element. Uh, you're aware of Beers Mill and the recent work on uh, Montgomery Hills and Forest Glen and Silver Spring will be no different. We fixed dozens of dangerous park trail crossings over the last couple of years. We've developed equity maps so we can make sure that both our efforts and the county's efforts on Vision Zero are focused on equity areas. And as you know, we included uh, major additional requirements for bike and pedestrian infrastructure as part of the growth and infrastructure policy you've just uh, adopted recently. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Justin McGowan to tell you about the pedestrian plan and also some of our comments on the county's Vision Zero work. Great, thank you, Chair Anderson. This is Jesse Cohn McGowan. I'm a transportation planner at the planning department in the countywide planning and policy division. I first just want to briefly share our comments on the 2030 action plan. We thought it was a really well-rounded, um, aggressive approach to reaching Vision Zero, though we did have a few comments on the planning board's comments. First, um, look to elevate one of the priority actions um, or elevate to a priority action Number S11, improved lighting. We see that this is really an equity issue as well as pedestrian safety issues. So we'd like to see elevated lighting in the top 10 priority actions. In addition, we had three comments related to metrics. Um, what gets measured gets managed. And so it's really important that the 2030 plan takes a comprehensive approach to metrics that looks not just at the number of sidewalks built, but where they're built and how they contribute to connectivity. And also that our metrics contribute to equity and are reported regularly as part of the two-year updates to the work plan. I'm going to briefly just highlight some of the efforts currently underway or recently completed at the planning department. So this spring, we released a Vision Zero Community Toolkit, which include, includes 40 safety treatments that address safety for pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists. We list the safety benefits as well as the expected crash reduction associated with these treatments, as well as where they're best suited in the county based on the Complete Streets Design Guide. I also want to note that this is available in both English and Spanish. And so this is one of the first Vision Zero documents that the planning department has put out in Spanish. And it's a 130, 100 or so pages. And so really kind of a thick technical resource that should be helpful to, to the residents, regardless of what language they speak. In addition, we put together an interactive web map, which depicts currently crashes from 2015 to 2019. But this summer, we'll be adding in the 2020 crashes. Um, you can see the link at the bottom. There's links for each of these items if you want to learn more in your staff packet. Um, but these allow you to, as you pan around the map, the summaries update to show you the, the crashes by mode as well as the severity. You can also isolate crashes or just select cr crashes that you're specifically interested in and export them either into a mapping tool or into a table to learn more. So if you just want to look at pedestrian crashes on Georgia Avenue and Silver Spring, you can now do that. And so this is a really easy tool, not just for um, planners and engineers, but also for the public to use to better understand the safety conditions in their neighborhood. 
Next, I want to acknowledge a project we're currently working on, the predictive safety analysis. So this is a technical effort that we're working on in partnership with the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. It's really data-driven looking at um, our roadway context, our land use context, and travel behavior to understand and estimate the expected number of crashes at all the intersections and segments in the county for primary crash types. And we'll be wrapping this up at the end of the year. Lastly, I just want to briefly mention um, Montgomery County's pedestrian plan that we're still working on at the planning department. Um, we're currently working on the existing conditions report, which is incredibly comprehensive. I just want to acknowledge three pieces of what that'll include. The first is the pedestrian level of comfort map, which is similar to the level of traffic stress that we did for the bicycle master plan, which describes walking conditions countywide. We also conducted a statistically significant pedestrian survey as well as a school travel tally with over 70,000 responses to how kids get to school, which can shed light on travel behavior and where improvements are most needed in school walk sheds. And then lastly, we've done some research to identify cutting edge pedestrian policies and design approaches in order to ensure that this pedestrian plan is really kind of leading the way with best practices. So that concludes my presentation and we're happy to answer any questions that you have in the following section. Thank you. And finally, you will hear from Christy Daphnis from the chair of the advisory committee. Right, thank you, Glenn. Um, and thank you to the council for inviting me to participate today. I sincerely appreciate the partnership and willing to work with the community that each and every one of you have exhibited. I understand that there are many competing priorities that you all have to juggle and balance, and I appreciate the prioritization you've given towards Vision Zero over the past two years. I must start by commending Wade Holland in the, in the county, executive, county Executive's Office and the work he's done to put together the new draft Vision Zero plan. While no plan is perfect, Wade has done a great job of um, pulling together a plan that is specific yet flexible and will provide a good roadmap as we continue uh, on the Vision Zero journey. I would also like to give huge kudos to Chris Conklin, Hannah Henn, and their team at MCDOT, as well as Erica Rigby, Derek Gunn, and Joe Moses at the State Highway Administration, as well as Casey Anderson, Mike Riley, Gwen Wright, Jesse McGowan, and other leaders and staff in, in Parks and Planning for the tremendous work done over the past year. These groups um, have really thought a lot about the safety and utilization of roadways within our communities, including but not limited to full support of shared streets, the county's new 20 is plenty campaign, joint planning and MCDOT complete streets design guidance and several intersection and corridor improvements across the county, um, while also dealing with the challenges related to COVID-19. I'll be brief in my remarks, but today I'd like to cover four main points, which can hopefully help guide how we can best implement Vision Zero and uh, its projects. First, the cost and budgeting for Vision Zero infrastructure and projects. Second, the approach to prioritizing Vision Zero projects and improvements, specifically looking at each decision concurrently through a connectivity and network impact lens, an equity lens, and a climate lens. Third, the need for continued process streamlining and improvements, as well as citizen engagement and communication. And last but not least, the need for enhanced collaboration to help spur innovation and progress. With regard to the cost and budgeting for Vision Zero projects, we have to remember, as you are all aware, a plan is just a plan until there are adequate resources to implement that plan. And it's overwhelming when we see the numbers. For example, as Wade cited, the 150 to $300 million just for safe routes to school sidewalks, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. However, if we truly want to make Vision Zero a reality, we need to continue to focus on funding and action. And one of the most important aspects of that is the improve, improvement in our roadway infrastructure. We cannot educate or enforce our way out of the public health and safety crisis made up of the countless injuries uh, and increasing number of deaths on our roadways. I recommend that the council look to set aside considerable amount of money. I'll just throw out 50 to $75 million as a start in the next capital budget to start tackling our highest priority infrastructure issues surrounding safety and moving people across all modes of transportation. Which brings me to my second point, prioritization. It is important that we use the principles and tools available to us to actually plan for and engage in a transparent prioritization process. Equity is paramount and must be looked at closely and carefully so we can put uh, in place a safe and just transportation infrastructure for our most vulnerable roadway users. Connectivity is also important 
and developing a connected system and multimodal network will help increase the convenience of using modes of transportation that are more climate friendly and safer options for citizens across all modes. Third, streamlining the engagement process will be crucial in swiftly implementing planned improvements. As it stands now, just as an example, basic sidewalk requests go into a 311 black hole, and it's nearly impossible for a citizen to understand not only how sidewalk requests are processed and prioritized, but also there's currently next to zero follow-up or transparency. Many things are request or demand driven versus being uh, driven by a proactive and thoughtful use of the data information and information we have available at our fingertips or close to being available. On the other hand, the system and processes should be redesigned so as not to cater to citizens who have used certain safety and user centric improvements as an encroachment or an inconvenience. Any of these projects that are in the public right of way and that are in the public's best interest should be done automatically. One person should not be able to stop a sidewalk or other project within the public right of way simply due to a pro procedural prolongment. Also, we should be very thoughtful about the availability of translation and interpretation services, making it easier to communicate with all Montgomery County residents and continue to utilize some of the remote civic participation tools that we found to be very helpful over the course of COVID-19. We need to continue to be better about meeting people where they are and getting out into the community. Last but not least, I would like to take my last few seconds here to talk about collaboration. Personally, I have seen firsthand how increased collaboration and discussion can lead to fast improvements and joint success. I will only mention the most recent collaboration on the Open Streets Project along University Avenue, or the Quick Road Diet, as Wade referred to it in his presentation, adding the dedicated bike lanes for approximately 1.5 miles in each direction along University Boulevard. This project, only a couple of weeks since its launch, has had a lot of positive support from the community, is calming traffic but not causing major congestion, improving safety along the newly buffered sidewalks, and providing connectivity between Sligo Parkway and the Wheaton Central Business District. The only reason this project exists is because of collaboration between the state, MCDOT, the council, parks and planning, and community advocates. We can't stop there. We need to continue to seek out additional opportunities and Open Streets Montgomery Coalition looks forward to continued conversation about where we can go from here. One of the greatest areas of opportunity that I see is in better defining and improving walk sheds and bike sheds at both transportation multimodal connection points, for example, around Metro stops and Purple Line stops and around community amenities like parks and libraries and especially around schools. Collaborative action oriented discussions will help us connect the dots. We need to improve collaboration overall and make that def the default in the process, not the anomaly, breaking down silos. Specifically, we need to set up structures that allow for real and meaningful and regular conversations and joint work opportunities between county and state employees, community leaders, diverse and representative citizen groups, uh, MCPS, MCDOT, MCPD, and others. On the school issue, MCDOT has made great strides with this school safety audit program, but those audits need to accelerate and they need to be made fully transparent and easy to find. And we need to develop better partnerships between the county's Safe Routes to School program and the community, including PTAs and school leaders. Currently, it continues to be acceptable to think of pedestrian and bike safety only within the four corners of a school's property and to add things like hazard bus routes or moving bus stops whenever there's a safety challenge on a nearby roadway versus really thinking about the whole picture of a child's journey to and from school. We need to resist the temptation to plan one-off things like bike rodeos and educational opportunities, which are important in their own right. Um, but we need to give an opportunity for the, the students and the community to plan for solutions. This will take a concerted effort on the part of everyone involved. Uh, before COVID-19, the MCC PTA Safe Routes to School Committee began to have quarterly meetings with MCPS, MCPD, MCDOT, council staff, the PBTSAC and SHA with the promise of a safety strategic plan and structured opportunities for quarterly engagement. Unfortunately, COVID-19 derailed those plans but I would urge this group to reconvene in the coming weeks before the school, fall school year is upon us. I will close with this thought. Really, isn't, isn't 
what Vision Zero is all about, thinking differently about how we plan and execute safety on our roadways, how to innovate, and who is at the table to help generate solutions, and then actually taking action. These are the questions we have to think about, and we have to think about how we can best leverage the plans and the Vision Zero um, plan that is in progress to actually make that happen. I thank each and every one of you for the actions you've taken to date, and I urge you to continue funding, continue to spur innovation and creative thinking, and continue to keep in mind the safety and well-being of all of our roadway users as the decisions come before you while, you while you sit in your seat on the dais. Thank you, and I look forward to continue working with you all. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Daphnis. Um, okay, uh, colleagues, I want to open up to your questions. Please try to keep them brief so we can try to stay on uh, track. Uh, Councilmember Glass requested this uh, great briefing, so thank you very much, and let me uh, call on him first. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, thank you to everybody uh, for your uh, your thorough presentations, uh, and for Dr. Orlin for, for arranging this briefing. And, and as uh, the Council President said, I, I had requested that the full Council have a conversation or get updated on our Vision Zero progress when we were taking up this budget, the FY22 budget during T&E session, uh, because uh, it was the FY21 budget that was the first budget where we had a had filled the Vision Zero coordinator position, uh, Mr. Mr. Holland's position. Uh, and I appreciate all of my colleagues for uh, prioritizing this and wanting a full briefing outside of the T&E committee. So, so I, I know that we've gotten a very deep dive into this important conversation. But the reason that we're all here having this conversation is because in this year alone, in 2021, there have been 159 serious collisions and five deaths involving pedestrians and cyclists. And since we last had a full council update on our Vision Zero efforts, which was back in January of 2020, there have been 660 incidents and 23 deaths. We're here because the status quo is unacceptable. And earlier this spring, I attended a memorial service for Claire Grossman, who was killed crossing Georgia Avenue after exiting the bus to get to her Aspen Hill home. And what made this tragic situation even more so was the fact that her husband was killed five years prior crossing the same stretch of road just two blocks away and i've spoken with their daughter rachel who has been absolutely beside herself and it underscores the fact that no family should ever such a suffer such a loss um and and with that as the context i really appreciate sha and um the counties, Department of Transportation, and Mr. Holland, and um, Ms. Daphnis, everybody who has shared some updates uh, about the work that they're doing and the work that we really need to do. But uh, I'll, I'll just, in brief, just share some of the, the highlights, I think, that are signals that we're moving in the right direction. And one of them is on Great Seneca Highway in Germantown, where our partners at the state level uh, reduced the speed limit by Seneca Valley High School, where I know I had been receiving a lot of correspondence about uh, concern of that area. And we reduced the speed limit from 50 to 35 miles per hour. Um, and that in conjunction with the 20 is plenty campaign that a number of us have been uh, attended and are extremely supportive of, uh, I, I think that is movement in the right direction, making sure that everybody feels safe on our roads and that residents can still get to school, get to their jobs, get to wherever they're going, but doing it in a more mindful fashion, a little bit slower. Uh, and then also at the same time, we just had the opening of the bike lanes uh, along University Boulevard uh, in, in the Wheaton Silver Spring area. And I know that a lot of us have been celebrating that new activity as well. And I've seen uh, I've seen riders and, and bicyclists uh, enjoying that. And so, um, you know, uh, 
I submitted a lot of questions that um, most of them have been answered in the in the appendices, uh, and so I'd, I I won't go go into that. But there are a few that I'm just going to elevate and and pull out for the record. Uh, and, and one of them is making sure that we continue moving forward with a new traffic signal that has been planned along Colesville Road Route 29 and Hastings Drive, uh, because that is a very dangerous intersection at Colesville Road and Indian Spring Drive. Uh, I know the neighborhood very well uh, and many residents uh, need that, that light there um, for their own safety. Um, and then uh, I'm just looking through my notes real quick and you know there, there are a number of other incident, uh, another a few other things that, that we can uh, absolutely work on bringing more Hawk signals. Um, I absolutely agree with the, the planning department's recommendation for increased lighting. Uh, if other types of infrastructure prove too costly, we need to shine a light lit literally and figuratively um, on the incidents that we're talking about and the locations that we're talking about. And then uh, one last thing that I don't think was included in this uh, already exhaustive presentation, but I think we need MCPS um, to, to um, strengthen their partnership with the county to make sure that students are getting to school safely. Uh, a number of us have been working with some advocates to make sure that there are uh, uh, bike locks, um, bike racks uh, at school so that kids can take the, their bicycles to school, relying less on their parents and other modes of transportation. Um, but uh, for, for various reasons, some of the principals and MCPS uh, uh, administrators are hesitant on allowing that. And then lastly, I think we need to also have a, a, a heat map uh, officially presented to us, uh, showing us what schools are safe and what schools need to be made safer. Uh, and so more information uh, from MCPS so that we can have uh, uh, safe routes to school, make them even safer. Uh, and the efforts that uh, all of us here in the council really care about, things that we've done in this budget and the work that's been done um, over the last many years, I think will move us in that right direction. And so I'm just cognizant of the time. Again, want to thank uh, the council president, all the uh, all, all of the presenters and my colleagues for, for engaging in this conversation. Uh, but while there has been a lot of work to move us in the right direction, there undoubtedly is more work that we need to do. Um, we need to invest more resources um, to make our roads safer for everybody. So thank you very much. And Mr. President, I yield back. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Council President. Thank you to Council Member Glass for requesting this. Thanks to all the presenters. Clearly, there is so much hard work that has gone into these issues. There's a renewed commitment to making our roadways safer for all road users. There's been a, a sea change the way that we talk about uh, these issues, uh, that there are no accidents, there are collisions, and those uh, collisions are preventable, and when they aren't, uh, the deaths are. Uh, we can uh, reduce the number of collisions, and when they happen, uh, we can make sure that nobody dies uh, for, for, from them. Uh, clearly, we made a lot of progress. We talked about that today, uh, but there is a lot more work uh, that we need to do that I know we all uh, recognize, and I know all of us uh, don't want to attend any more vigils, don't want to place any more ghost bikes or, or, or ghost shoes uh, along Montgomery County's uh, roadways. And in order to do that, we have to continue this work and we really have to supercharge uh, the work. It's a hundred years of uh, dangerous uh, designs that we can't afford to wait a hundred years to fix intersection uh, by intersection. Uh, appreciate the uh, responses to some of my specific comments. I just wanna uh, follow up on, on a couple here uh, quickly. I'm gonna go slightly out of order to how I presented uh, the questions because I wanna start with uh, my thanks. Uh, so first uh, uh, to uh, uh, MCDOT on uh, MacArthur Boulevard near Old Anglers Inn and the uh, CNO Canal, uh, Canal Towpath. Uh, uh, DOT last year installed concrete barriers and pylons to physically prevent illegal parkers from the shoulders of the stretch at MacArthur, obviously a very popular uh, trail. Uh, and uh, the uh, parkers oftentimes were completely blocking uh, pedestrians and bicycle access and made it a very dangerous uh, place. I just wanted to thank uh, DOT for your uh, work here. Years of asking police to enforce this uh, simply has not worked. It can't work because police, you know, quite literally can't keep up with uh, the needs here. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it was uh, clear that 
uh, DOT really stepped up here, worked with some of the local residents uh, that had concerns about how this was going to work uh, and uh, really did make pedestrians, bicyclists and drivers uh, a top priority. And so I just wanted to, to thank you for that. It shows that uh, the physical barriers that you put up uh, do make a difference. Uh, it has, uh, and, 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 and it will continue uh, to make a significant difference. I, I do think that there is a major collision, perhaps even a death that will be prevented because of those changes. And so uh, I just wanna thank you because in other words, uh, what uh, DOT did there was true vision zero. Sometimes we confuse the term, but uh, real engineering changes that uh, make safety uh, improvements. So thank you for that. Uh, secondly, uh, the uh, response uh, that the drivers in the fatal and near fatal uh, pedestrian involved crashes on Montrose Road, uh, I appreciate those uh, responses and the fact that they weren't charged uh, and, and were determined to be driving less than 40 uh, miles per hour, which uh, is the, the posted speed limit. But I just wanted to note that it's important to understand that while uh, that may be a suitable response uh, to questions about a police investigation, it really isn't an adequate response when it comes to vision zero. Uh, so we really need to know what happened in those crashes and how do we prevent what happened from happening again. Specifically, in the December 2019 crash, it was reported that the pedestrian who was hit and severely injured, a Walter Johnson High School student, was trying to get on a school bus to the other side of Montrose Road. Do we know if that's the case? Was the victim trying to get to a, a school bus? So, Council Member Friedson, this is Michael Paler. Um, you know, thank you so much again for the opportunity to, to speak at this event. So according to uh, what we had determined, and I guess maybe MCPD, unless, um, unless Lieutenant Ruane, you want to speak to this? Um, Actually, Michael, if you want to start, I'll, I'll okay. chime in on, on something else. On so the so uh, according to the reports that we've seen and, and what we understand happened is that there was a, a school bus that was uh, stopped in, in the travel lane with yellow flashers on and the student was on one of the, um, uh, the pedestrian refuge islands that were installed on that roadway and he was leaving that island and, and that's when he was struck by a passing vehicle, so. So we really have to hone in on the fact that the driver didn't see the pedestrian and why. You know, did the driver turn from their lane to pass a vehicle that was stopped at the crosswalk? Is this a multi-lane you know, threat? Uh, are there engineering changes that we can make to ensure that a multi-lane uh, threat uh, doesn't happen? Uh, you know, looking into you know how much a road diet would would cost, whether a road diet in this particular area uh, would be appropriate in order to avoid uh, that uh, type of uh, you know tragedy from from happening again. That could have uh, been even worse uh, uh, the the latest uh, than, than it was, and was uh, terrible uh, as it was, uh, and. You know, how is it possible that, you know, in, in certain contexts, it's cost prohibitive for us uh, to do uh, road safety engineering uh, projects uh, and others it isn't. Uh, the parks uh, uh, change uh, at uh, the Capitol Crescent Trail and Little Falls Parkway is an example. They put up plastic uh, pylons. It was not a cost prohibitive uh, action to take and we we're able to move uh, forward. I won't ask for a specific response to that. I will just raise the rhetorical issue that uh, we really have to get out of the uh, non-Vision Zero responses to Vision Zero questions. I know it's a process to get to where we want to be, uh, but we're not quite there yet in terms of how we uh, address uh, uh, these uh, issues. Uh, I'll just close uh, here uh, thanking SHA and appreciate your responses uh, on the Old Georgetown Road uh, questions. Uh, that was an example of a road diet uh, that we worked together on. I I uh, really wish we were able to move forward with a lot of these engineering changes uh, without the need for uh, somebody like Jake Castle, 17 year old to have been killed before we did it. Uh, but I appreciate the fact that State Highway uh, stepped up to do this, that you're looking at the entire stretch as Delegate Corman and I had uh, requested as part of a broader uh, project that you're continuing uh, on with that. I'll just ask my last question. Uh, uh, did uh, MCDOT submit public comment to the Federal Highway Administration uh, for needed improvements to the MUTCD so we can make the engineering safety changes that we've now talked about we know we need uh, as um, many transportation departments and localities across the country have? 
did we submit formal comment as a county? Um, so I can explain that DOT was very, very engaged in the MUTCD process, um, both our policy team and our traffic team. And Michael, do you wanna add any specifics to the actual comments that we provided? I'm sorry, um, I was I was actually trying to, to do some coordination on the side, so I wasn't, I missed that part of the question. And you, our, our formal comments for MUTCD. Oh, and so the question was, did we provide any? I know that, yeah. so so as a whole, I think there were the comments to the MUTCD, the, uh, the NPA were provided in pieces and parts. So um, uh, there were several several divisions engaged in that, and so I know that there were comments that were sent from from multiple divisions, but they weren't sent in a in a mass email or mass send out. And we also contributed pretty extensively to different professional organizations, groups of engineers, different cities that were all compiling comments and contributed to each of those kind of larger efforts for MUTCD. Could you compile the comments that were made on behalf of the county on the MUTCD and just share them with the council? I think it would be really helpful. Um, Absolutely. This is critical. Just, I mean, MUTCD sounds like a bunch of letters, but this is the basis by which every single decision on a road safety engineering change uh, is made. Too often, uh, we uh, get a no that communities desperately want because of what's written in the MUTCD and the latest iteration of the MUTCD is nearly as flawed as it has always been because one of the main aspects of it is that it uh, you know, requires in many cases a tragedy to happen uh, before uh, changes uh, get made, which is an unacceptable uh, situation uh, for us uh, to be in. I'll just say again, we can't wait 100 years uh, to redesign roadways that reflect modern uses, modern communities, and keep residents safe. We have a lot more work uh, to do and uh, dealing with this intersection by intersection uh, while important is, is gonna take far too long. So we have to both do the intersection work, uh, but then we have to do the much uh, broader holistic uh, and comprehensive work and look forward to working together with everybody uh, in order to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Novato. Thank you, Mr. President, and then Councilmember Glass for requesting uh, that this would be for full council. I think we would definitely do for an update. Uh, and I must agree that as we look at the responses that are contained in the packet of the questions that we submitted, um, that there is no doubt that a lot of effort um, has, has been already um, recognized. Uh, and the collaboration, I think, has improved significantly. So I, I do want to. Um, commend everybody for doing that kind of work. I agree that in the upcoming budgets, we do have to continue to enhance the work we're doing. Uh, it's absolutely true that now I think we have a pretty decent blueprint, but there's no doubt that all these collisions and these fatalities are telling us that we have to move a lot quicker. Um, so I, I wanna acknowledge that and I wanna acknowledge the work of our uh, constituents for constantly uh, you know, telling us, sharing with us different types of um, possibilities and, and opportunities. And of course, Ms. Daphne is who has done an extraordinary job and not only continuing to raise the awareness, but coming up with some very targeted uh, solutions as well. So I, I wanted to highlight all of that. Um, I know that you know we're running late, but I, I did want to, um, first day that I'm still waiting on a response from a May 7th letter that I sent um, over to Secretary Slater regarding uh, that area of Georgia Avenue and Rippling Brook Drive where there was that horrible tragedy where uh, Mrs. Grossman um, lost her life because of that collision, uh, you know, requesting uh, installation of a hawk signal as, where, as, as well as enhanced lighting we know that there have been other issues there. Uh, there have been some things that were done with lowering speeds, but we know that there's more that needs to be done. And um, I, I continue to check in to see where we are in that process. And I've been told that there's still some studies going on. So I just wanted to highlight that to SHA folks and please look into that and see um, what we can do because obviously this is an area that we don't need to see another tragedy occur. Um, Secondly, in terms of the Sheriff Street pilot on University Boulevard to Ercola, which is 
super exciting because it's something that I think folks uh, need to see to understand how uh, impactful it can be. I will um, request that as has been done in the past, please let my office know. We do not find out until Ms. Chris definitely actually contacted us and let us know it was happening. And by then we were starting to hear a lot from our constituents and there was just a lot of chatter on all of the listservs. Um, so it would be great if um, our office uh, could be notified so that as constituents begin to call us as we go out into the community and we're asked that we can you know, properly explain what's happening and why um, it is something that we do need to try and see. And, and, I, and I have also seen basically mostly recently a lot of positive feedback about that particular pilot. Um, want to give kudos to the lighting recommendation. There's no doubt that this is another thing that we should be looking at. I know previous councils have looked at that this a lot. Um, I pushed uh, for better lighting at New Hampshire Avenue in the Colesville area. And uh, lo and behold, that really helped a lot, especially as you have our residents trying to negotiate these types of large avenues, trying to access public transportation, trying to get to the bus at, you know, at dusk and especially in the winter time. And it makes a, a world of difference. And I know that we do have um, items in our CIP and, and as well as our just operating budget where we can take a look at lighting. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of looking at that as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to elevate those issues. Um, I, I, I invite everybody who's interested in this to take a look at the responses that were sent over. I think they were pretty comprehensive, um, but just wanna say that there's no doubt that we have to continue to, to do quite a bit. Um, nonetheless, I, again, can definitely uh, see firsthand an increased, um, a lot of progress in increased collaboration, which is what it's going to take if we are to navigate this challenge, given that some streets are under county DOT, others are under SHA, and that is always, um, you know, a bit of a struggle, uh, but, but definitely we can continue to, to get better at that. Uh, so thanks everybody for everything that you are doing in this very important space. I just want to apologize, Ms. Navarro. I, I will be sure to include you in all distributions moving forward. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. So I'm going to try and be fast here. Um, first, shout out to Melissa Reagan and Miriam Schoenbaum because they are the ones who made Seneca Valley happen. Uh, they reached out to myself as well as Councilmember Glass. Uh, and really said, hey, we need to look at this speed limit that is what we changed when we had Northwest High School and the incident there and it dropped the speed limit. We need to do the same thing there. And then I want to give a shout out to Erica Rid Rigby uh, with uh, SHA because she's the one that worked with my office uh, directly and kept in contact with us and let us know uh, when they had made the positive change. So really appreciate and shout out to my staff, uh, both Kristen and Sharon for all of their great work as always. So it does work. Um, the system does work. I think Ms. Daphnis is right though, that it always seems to be those that are connected and know who's, you know, who to talk to. Um, so I, then I, you know, want to transition to my folks in Montgomery Village who are experiencing some of the same kinds of challenges, A, when it comes to speeding and B, when it comes to schools. Uh, when I look at what's happening, um, you know, uh, with the East Village Avenue uh, and the speeding that goes there. Lieutenant Rain, I know that, um, I think it was uh, Sergeant uh, Deslorias uh, did uh, some research in terms of uh, what they could possibly do in that area. And the numbers didn't come up with uh, what it was that our residents are seeing and experiencing. But I'm concerned about the centralized traffic unit only being in 5D and 60 every six weeks or so, and what that means for enforcement uh, to ensure that residents in that area don't have that high cycle of uh, folks that are uh, speeding up and down. We know, uh, especially with COVID and because there's been less traffic on the roads, we've seen speeding continue to increase in a lot of these areas. And so I just encourage us to uh, look at ways in which we can creatively address the situation there, whether it's a speed camera or other kinds of things that we know are good for those kinds of things because it, it makes people slow down in those areas and they'll avoid it if it's got a speed camera. Uh, so again, maybe that's the best thing for us instead of just you know having an officer out there to enforce. So I'll leave that up to you guys to make those uh, very large budget decisions. Um, 
But when it comes to uh, safe routes to school, and I did want to spend just a little bit of time on that. Look, here's the reality. And so part of what Ms. Daphnis and others have said, and Mr. Holland have said, I agree with part of it. I don't know if it's always uh, a possibility for us, even with road diets, to make it safe for some of our students to walk to school. And so we actually need to start looking at ways in which we can bus some of our kids. When I think about the kids who live in the Canterbury apartments, that's right on Father Hurley. So they already have to navigate Father Hurley, which even if you did the road diet, I mean, it's still a high speed roadway. Even if you drop the speed down, it's still a higher speed roadway uh, that links directly to I-270. And so from that perspective, that's a dangerous intersection. Then you've got the one that's at Middlebrook and 118, which is a dangerous intersection. So you've got Middlebrook and Father Hurley, then you've got Middlebrook and 118, and then they navigate going down Middlebrook. And so in those areas, and keep in mind, that's not far from where Christina Morris Ward lost her life uh, some years back. Maybe it's just better for us. And I've had this conversation with our school system about busing some of our kids to school, just understanding that some of them we can't even engineer ourselves out of. Uh, and, and, and so while I agree that you know we can't with enforcement and education, we also always can't do it with engineering as well. And so we really are gonna have to make some tough decisions about where to put our investment. And so I'm pushing us for a lot of these schools. I know that council member Juwando, and I don't wanna steal his thunder, had talked about some of the schools in his district and about the unsafe nature that's there. Well, why wait for uh, us to have capital funds for a sidewalk to be built when we can actually just start blessing our kids to school, which is safer uh, and gets them there and you know is efficient, all those kinds of things. So again, we need to be talking about that as well uh, in the context of our safe routes to school conversation. Again, it's not gonna be right for everything, but we do need to add that other tool element, I think, into our toolbox and start talking about that as we try and figure out ways to ensure uh, that our children only have to worry about uh, getting A's and B's in school and not worry about the safety uh, as they try and get to and from home. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. President. Thank you. And, and I don't know if anybody wanted to quickly respond uh, from our police about the centralized traffic unit, but that is a question that I'm very concerned about and just wondered what folks' thoughts may be. It, it, Michael Romain from uh, the traffic division. I will tell you that is a very hot topic of discussion. Like you mentioned, 560 every six weeks. We are having lots of discussion that everybody gets attention all the time. We don't want to say we're going to focus on one area and the rest of the county is, is left. Uh, not attended to. So I say we have more discussion, but I, we are definitely on the same page that that is not not part of our plan. Thank you, sir. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, two quick things. One is uh, we've received multiple constituent calls about 311 being down. We have notified Ken Hartman and Marlene, but you're off. You, I figured all my colleagues might want to know that because you'll be getting some of the same calls. We've also emailed all the chiefs. Um, number two, uh, Christy mentioned the, the black hole of 311 for sidewalk requests. Ms. Hen, Mr. Paler, tell me if I'm wrong, but sidewalk re requests, my understanding is, are supposed to go to Lori Main in, in DOT, Lori.Main at MontgomeryCountyMD.gov. Is that correct? Yes, so we, my understanding is that we actually, we have an online form for filling out a right. sidewalk request. So we have the installation request form and we receive a, a couple hundred of those each year. Um, and then we have funding to support about 10 to 15 per year. So if you are actually looking to put in a new request, then the form is the best way. Lori can absolutely answer questions on the status and we can also follow up um, afterwards. We heard and noted the, the comment on the challenges of finding out the status of a request. So I've actually already seen some messages going around during this meeting to see how we can have a better approach to that and ensure that we make improvements there. Okay, great. Uh, Council Member Juwanda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and thank you to uh, Councilmember Glass and uh, everyone. This is an important discussion. Uh, glad you requested it. Uh, and I'm really excited to see the presentations. I also want to start with, it's very easy to focus in on what we're not doing because this, prog prog this uh, problem is so immense. But I do want to say also, we are doing a lot and we're focusing on it a lot more than other jurisdictions. So I, I really appreciate 
the work that we're doing. Uh, I have no, as, as with other issues, I have no problem saying we're doing, we're doing, I'm glad what we're doing what we're doing, but we can always do more. And uh, that's kind of the Montgomery County challenge and opportunity, I think, generally. Um, uh, I Just two uh, quick things. I uh, was really happy to see Mr. Holland, uh, uh, your focus in on the slide of what, just kind of going a little more in depth on what you plan to do with the money uh, that I had suggested and all my colleagues agreed to add to Safe Routes to Schools to do the additional analysis. Um, and you, you had a back of the envelope number that I just would like you to restate. Um, it's probably more than back of the envelope, but you said a number of, based on what you know today, what would need to be invested to uh, uh, take care of the walk sheds and the routes to schools that exist so far? And I might be misstating what you said, but could you restate that? Yeah, thanks for the question. So we this was developed part of um, a legislative analysis, I think for two uh, state legislative sessions ago. So to determine the cost of either one side of the road having a sidewalk or both sides having this sidewalk in the MCPS defined walk sheds. Uh, the estimate ranged from anywhere between about $100 million upwards of $350 million just for one side of the road for those incomplete sidewalk networks in the walk shed. Okay. And would that include, because one of the things that came out when I was digging into this issue, there was the how MCPS defines safe routes to school, that analysis just around the school, but it sounds like you're describing the deeper analysis that goes a little further out. Yeah, so um, Hannah, feel free to, to jump in if I misstate this, but the Montgomery County Public Schools defines kind of what the walk shed or where the you know, kids they expect to be able to, to safely walk to school within a certain area of their neighborhoods. And that's the areas we use for our walk audits. I don't know if Hannah, you wanna jump in there and kind of add to that, but that's kind of the level of analysis we do for we determine walkability. Yeah, okay. And, and I understand what we funded though, my understanding was this, this second, the second level analysis, maybe Michael, I don't know, I, I might be misstating. I think you know what I'm saying. There's two levels of analysis. There's that immediate MCPS definition. Then there's the, the, the kind of County more larger. So, so I can, I can respond to that. So we, we use the walk shed as defined by MCPS, but the two phases that council member Jawando is referring to is that in an initial, of, MCDOT's initial evaluation of walkability over under school, there's phase one analysis, which really just looks at the school frontage and then what the additional funding has gone to expedite and what we are hoping to accelerate um, more as the years go, go forward is this phase two analysis. Perfect. So the phase two analysis looks at the broader walk shed and looks at much more extensive improvements that are needed in the area. Great. Yeah, and that, and that obviously has multiple benefits to the to the children and their families, but also the area in general. Um, okay, so great, and and I, I I think all of us hope I've heard this from my colleagues now and before that, as we have this information, we will be able to come back and Miss Miss Dolphins. I think I appreciate your advocacy and make some robust investments uh, in this area. This is this is needed uh, in, a, in a in a very big way. Go ahead, Christy. Are you trying to say something? Yeah, um, if, you, if you don't mind, I just want to respond to one comment thread here from both Councilmember Rice and Councilmember Chiwondo. Um, I agree that we, you know, sometimes need to use buses. I think my point, which may have been lost a bit, is that we need to have a better conversation around when we need to use buses versus when we need to improve the infrastructure. Absolutely. And there are examples, I understand your example, um, Council Member Rice, uh, it's a big highway. There are examples near my neighborhood, our coal elementary has three bus routes. And one of the reasons they have one of those bus routes is because of a four way stop on two county roads that are not even arterials. So I think that there's a range of things here and there are a range of options for getting kids to school safely. And the culture is what I'm referring to when I'm talking about the, the safety stopping at the corners of the school, because it's easy to say for the school leadership to say, and for MCPS leadership to say, let's just add a bus route because it's easier. And, or let's you know add a crossing guard. In some cases, a crossing guard or a bus route might be the right thing to do. But in other cases, right. it might not be. And, um, you know, it's 
this, the way that these things are being applied, they're not being applied equitably across the county either. So I just, I just wanted to make those points and I look forward as, as a MCCPTA leader and as the PBTSAC chair, I look forward to working with you all and some of the other advocates who are out there making some of these same points to come up with a solution that really makes sense to get our kids to school safely. Awesome, I'll withhold the rest of my other question, which is related to signal timing, but I'll follow up with the DOT. Right. This is really important. Appreciate the, uh, the fact that we're taking it up at full council. Thank you. Council Vice President Albert Rose. Uh, Wow, uh, there's a lot to process today. Um, this is a very impressive presentation. Clearly, a lot of progress has been made. Clearly, this is an all hands on deck situation. Uh, thank you again, Councilmember Glass, for uh, for asking that this be a full council briefing. I just have two points. I'm going to follow up with some additional questions offline, but um, tremendous that the toolkit has been made available in Spanish. I've been playing around with it. Uh, during your guys's presentation, and it's a terrific It's a ter it's a terrific tool. Um, we have stumbled on, I think, some some really unique best practices uh, within our minority health initiatives and program, and getting messaging out regarding COVID testing uh, and vaccine importance to our immigrant and multicultural and multi ethnic communities. Um, and I think that's a wave we can ride uh, as as we continue to make progress in addressing COVID. Um, that group will continue to meet, uh, that group will continue to work. And I think there's an opportunity for us to align this terrific work with those efforts and also look at, you know, Spanish and English is obviously am amazing, but it should be in Amharic, it should be in Chinese, it should be in Vietnamese. So I think there's an opportunity for us to expand our outreach uh, to a number of other communities, which I think could be could be really helpful. And our office, and I know all of our offices are uh, ready and willing uh, to help in any way that we can. Um, just a couple of other reflections um, and, and Christy's comments about sidewalks really resonated with me uh, because I think the tide has turned. Um, sidewalks continue to be a really contentious issue that divide communities, but I get the distinct sense, um, particularly in those areas where there have been more incidents that people are much more open to and willing uh, to, to provide recommendations on things like sidewalks. But many of my constituents also have other terrific recommendations. And, uh, and, and in real time, the folks who are the most impacted sense what's happening the most um, need to send that somewhere. And so uh, we've made great strides, notwithstanding the downtime of 311 today, um, but, but that is a tremendous tool that has also made a lot of progress. And so if there's a better mechanism for us to more coherently collect information, even if it's anecdotal uh, from, from residents, I think that could be helpful in guiding us in some of our strategic planning moving forward. So those are just some of my initial thoughts and reactions. We've got a lot more to get to today, um, but I appreciate the presentation and look forward to the follow-up. Thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, and I will be brief. It is it has certainly been said by my colleagues today, and we sincerely thank Councilmember Glass for for, for suggesting the uh, the update, and for all the agencies and all the people who presented. Uh, we we will follow up in, in, uh, as well. Um, you know, uh, to the to the points earlier that were made earlier about sidewalks. They are contentious. There are people that that want them in front of their house, and there are people that do not. There are people that believe that the that the area and in, in, in the grassy areas, that it's actually a part of their yard, and of course it's a part of the right-of-way. Having said that, we cannot be too safe, and we need to continue to work together to make certain that not only our young people, but all people uh, who, who are, are pedestrians and who want to, to uh, cross the street or whatever they need to do, that there is an ability to do it. And we need to continue to figure out what's the best way to do that. If it means more bus uh, bus service, then that's what we should do. We should do it all. And so I appreciate this. I We're running late and I appreciate that as well. But I have to say that this is an issue that cannot go away. This is an issue that literally is of a, of a life and death uh, uh, situation. So thank you very much, Mr. President. 
Uh, thank you very much to everybody for your presentations. Very, very helpful and all your good work. We look forward to continued discussions on this topic. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we can move on. Uh, we're behind again, folks. Um, so we are sitting as the district council. Item, the next item is a work session on the zoning text amendment 1907 telecommunications tower, towers limited use. Um, I'll just say at the beginning, there are many strong opinions we all are aware of about this issue. We've received a lot of communication from the public, even in just the last few days. We are planning on spending an hour just to begin the discussion today and understand how the Fed committee approached the proposed ZTA. We're not planning to take any votes today, um, and we know we'll return to this at a future work session. Let me turn it over to the Fed committee chair um, and then uh, attorney Ndu. Chairman Reamer. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, just for a little context here, uh, several council members have asked if I will express some, you know, more extensive views at the beginning of this, uh, since I've been working on this for more than five years now. Um, I, I will do that in the context of advancing the committee's recommendation, uh, which is a very strong recommendation. And then I will turn it over to our terrific analyst, uh, Ms. Ndu, who is done an excellent job with the packet. Um, and uh, for those who want to follow along, I'm sure you're reading the packet, which you can readily find on the County Council website. Um, and so I'll, I'll make some comments. Uh, they'll be a little bit more extensive. Open the floor for any council members who wanted to make a comment, I should say. And then we'll go to uh, the council attorney uh, who can walk through the packet. Um, so just to set expectations about how we'll proceed. And then, as you said, Mr. Council President, we'll try to keep today for an hour and, um, you know, we'll come back. I believe we're scheduled in two weeks, uh, for the follow-up. Um, so there won't be any votes today, as, as you said already. Um, well, uh, I'm glad we're, I'm glad we're here. This has been a long time coming, um, many years of, of uh, conversation and, and incremental uh, changes. Um, to me, this today's discussion, this, this zoning change is really about whether Montgomery County, which is one of the leading scientific capitals of the world, will embrace technology. Um, you know, it's very simple, actually. Uh, and, I, and I think it's about whether elected officials can make the changes that we need to be competitive. I know all of us are concerned about the job trends that we're seeing. There's a new study that came out this week from Empower Montgomery that just reemphasizes what we've known. For the recent years, most job creation has happened outside of Montgomery County in this region in Virginia, mostly and in DC to some extent, and we have been a distant third and we need to make a lot of different changes in order to strengthen our position. Uh, today's discussion is without question part of that. Um, and third, I think it's really about whether we all, and I believe we do, have a better understanding of public health and how the public health system works and who we would listen to uh, on matters of public health. And we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this very briefly once at the outset. I don't think we really need to spend much time on it. But we're hearing a lot of false claims about health concerns for uh, the, the waves that come out of our devices, you know, that connect from our device to an antenna, that connect from a Wi-Fi router in our house to our laptop, you know, that connect, frankly, uh, AM, FM radio, or uh, all, all of this is all part of a spectrum. It's called non-ionizing radiation. And Science has found, has not yet found a health concern with any of it. Uh, it is one of the most extensively studied um, issues out there. And if we were hearing from people like Dr. Fauci, Dr. Walensky, uh, the head of the FDA, that they had a concern, like we would all know if our leading scientific agencies were concerned about this. Um, we do not hear from them. Um, and I want to even say there is an entity called the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements. It's based, its headquarters is in Bethesda. It's a national agency chartered by Congress to safeguard public health 
on radiation protection. They are here. They conduct studies and research and symposia and conferences. I've talked to the chair of their advisory board. They are not raising concerns about any of these aspects of uh, emissions from devices, cell towers. There are federal guidelines that must be followed and any proposal that we would put forward will follow federal guidelines. That is how the, the health is uh, safeguard. Um, and for those of you who are not here and have become familiar with Dr. Earl Stoddard, he testified in favor of 5G uh, under former County Executive Isaiah Leggett many years ago. Uh, he talked about the importance for public health and emergency response of continuing to expand our wireless networks. So I, I wanna briefly describe the legislative history. I think we even heard today that this issue is being rammed through the council. Some of us joked it's on the back of a tortoise. Uh, our county zoning code was written to allow for really large macro towers. So when you use your phone, it's connecting to an antenna that's on a tower off distance, off in the distance, could be half mile, it could even be farther away. Uh, that is what our zoning code allows. It does not allow for placement of antennas for your phone to talk to on light poles, on utility poles. And that is where the networks need to expand to. Uh, so the networks cannot expand where they need to expand to because the zoning code prohibits these devices, this equipment from being placed on those locations. In 2016, Councilmember Fullerene introduced legislation. Uh, the public hearing on that bill, or that ZTA was in July, 2016, so five years ago. There was a very well attended community meeting that fall. I still think I'm still uh, experiencing shockwaves from that. Uh, we did not take action. We felt there was more discussion needed. We asked the county executive, Mr. Leggett, to lead an extensive community dialogue, which he did throughout the course of the next year, 2017. Again, that dialogue about one issue and one issue only. Can we allow antennas to power our devices to be placed on light poles and on utility poles? The result of that process was a zoning text amendment 1802 came to the county council in 2018. There was a public hearing in 2018. In the end, the county council decided to take a half step and stripped out residential zones and only allowed for the placement of antennas on poles in the commercial and non-residential areas. And that passed in May, 2018. Later that year, I introduced ZTA 1811, intended to allow the missing, the far greater missing part of the county to be covered by the antennas that we must have for our devices to connect. I introduced that in July, 2018. We had a public hearing in September. Ultimately, the council declined to act and that ZTA expired. In October of 2019, I introduced ZTA 1907 uh, and there was a public hearing in November of 2019. We had three committee work sessions uh, and we have had a lot of conversation. We decided to wait at the request of council members for litigation that the county was party to. That litigation has been resolved, it's over. Yesterday, in fact, the Supreme Court denied to hear a case. Uh, it is over, the, the legal case is over. Um, so I know it's been a difficult decision. It has been a divisive issue. Uh, it, and I think there's no question, it has been the most debated issue, the most discussed issue, the one with the most public engagement of any issue that I have seen in my 11 years on the council. Um, so that is just a little bit of the legislative context. Now, what is the issue? The issue is that our networks are running out of capacity. I'd like to make an analogy here. Have you ever had to improve the Wi-Fi in your home? I imagine you probably have. The way that you probably did that was you upgraded your router and or you changed the location of your router and you found with faster equipment with a better location you could get access to wi-fi throughout your house and you could work in various different rooms or put a tv in a room where you didn't have one before 
That is basically the same thing as what we are contemplating here. Our network needs to be strengthened. It doesn't reach everywhere that it needs to reach. We've got to have faster equipment and we've got to have it in better locations. And that's what this ZTA will legalize. I've passed around a document, uh, five reasons for 5G now, some of the reasons we need to take this seriously, one of them, distance learning. Councilmember Rice really leaned hard this year at the Education Committee on distance learning and ensured that children who do not have fiber optic connectivity at home, do not have Wi-Fi that their Chromebooks can tap into to do video, got a MiFi device. They got a wireless device that they could bring inside their home and connect. And we passed out, I think, close to 15,000 of those. So there are 15,000 households without Wi-Fi at home, without fiber to the home. And their families definitely have devices. There's no question their parents have phones. Their ki those kids probably even have phones. 5G will enable them to have broadband speeds. When it is built, it will have broadband speeds on the devices that they already use. They won't have to have fiber to the home to get broadband speeds. And we've had to solve for that problem in, in as limited a way as we could. Telework, I think we all know we are relying more than ever on wireless to work from home. And we have a seamless transition from Wi-Fi at home to walking out on the porch, switching to the wireless network around us, that is just a glimpse of the future. But working from home must have powerful wireless networks. And that's what this zoning change is seeking to add. Telemedicine, the future of medicine is about video interaction and whether even performing surgery, you know, evaluations requires high bandwidth capacity. A good example of why we are running out of room in our networks, why they are maxing out. Public safety, video 911. You know, most phone calls to 911 are made from home. In the future, we wanna do video 911 and we'll need networks. You gotta have powerful networks to do that. So at the end of the day, this is going to create a more competitive broadband sector. It's going to allow for people to have broadband speeds with just their device. They don't have to have fiber to the home. Uh, and it will help bring many people into broadband speeds who today don't have it. Um, that is why all these trends are why demand is growing so exponentially. And the amount of data that is consumed per device has increased like exponentially. You know, every year it increases again by an exponential level. I think we can all intuitively imagine why that is the case but our network is limited. It's like the place where the physical infrastructure, of the network is limited and it won't work. It, like it won't work for the next five or 10 years because there's just not enough places to put antennas. That's the problem. That is the core problem that we have. So in response to this problem, our regional counterparts have taken action. Arlington, Virginia allows antennas anywhere in the right of way. Doesn't matter how close it is to anything. If there is a pole or a whatever in the, light of, in the right of way, you can put an antenna on it in Arlington. That is one of our prime economic development competitors. DC allows antennas 10 feet from a building. That's how close they allow them. A, a townhouse, an apartment building, uh, a retail frontage, doesn't matter. Can't just be closer than 10 feet, but you can get to 10 feet. If you understand that it's not a health risk, what is the argument to prohibit it? Please think about that. Fairfax, 10 feet from the property line. Even Prince George's is 30 feet from an occupied dwelling. By right, no, no special process. So you know, that is how our regional counterparts are responding to the need for future growth in wireless service and demand. There may be those who don't see the benefit, don't want to cast, you know, get, get involved in the benefit. I think Ms. Levu made it very clear that the ordinance that you have before us also 
complies with federal mandates that are now law. They have been challenged, the challenges have failed. Those federal FCC requirements force the local jurisdiction to be able to process applications in a certain amount of time with a certain level of expense. And the zoning code that we crafted at the Fed Committee, and I wanna thank my colleagues at the Fed Committee, the zoning code that we crafted is intended to meet that federal requirement. So, you know, we don't feel that we can put up roadblocks even if we wanted to because federal action has been very clear as to what the expectation is. Um, now, I think the better reason to do this is not because the federal government has mandated it. It's because in the last few years, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook have all moved to Northern Virginia. Uh, those trends keep me up at night. I think they may, maybe they do you as well. Um, this vote, this bill is going to have an impact on that trend, one way or the other. And you know, we have to have adequate wireless coverage here. We have to embrace technology. So there are, we are experiencing a strong demand to limit where these antennas can be installed. I will, again, offer a simple analogy. If you would limit where these antennas can be installed, what is the difference between doing that and saying, people can only put Wi-Fi routers in their basement? You know, what is the fundamental difference? A, 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 an ordinance that limits where these can go in a significant way will work for some neighborhoods, they'll work for some houses, they won't work for others. So there will be people who are left out of wireless connectivity, will have less wireless connectivity than others. And I just don't think we want our community to be in that circumstance. Um, so last thing I'll say, we're getting a lot of emails. Uh, hats off to those who are sending out misleading comments over community listservs, getting people to send in emails on the basis of a false impression of what this will do. Sure, but I ask you to think about your constituents and what their expectations are when they walk into the Apple store or they walk into the Best Buy and they put their hard earned money down on that counter and they sign up for a device. Don't they want the best service that they can get? And doesn't that count? Shouldn't we listen to them? You know, yes, we are getting some emails, but put yourself in the shoes of that construction worker, that teacher, that nurse, they work hard, they put a lot of money every month toward their cell phone service, and they deserve to get their money's worth. And that's what this zoning text amendment is gonna allow. They're gonna pay the same here as they'll have to pay in Fairfax or DC, but they'll get less service here if we don't do this. They want their devices to work and they want the best service that their money can buy and we should not work against them on that. Um, so if we don't approve of this zoning change, it's a fact that many parts of the county will have less service than, than others. It'll be very circumstantial. Um, and the wireless companies are then gonna have to determine if they wanna sue. And I have to say, I don't know if they'll sue because it may not be financially worth it to them to sue the county, spend all that money, take us to court. You know, who knows how they'll react. In the meantime, we'll just slip. That's what we'll do. We'll fall behind further. Our wireless coverage will not be adequate. And, you know, that will be the impact of removing poles from consideration. Um, while our competitive jurisdictions don't. So uh, this ordinance is designed to ensure that we don't get less, that we don't have less wireless coverage than we should have, that we get just as much as people living in other parts of the region, just as much as people pay for and, and deserve. And I really commend the committee recommendation to you. It's strong and I hope we'll pass it. So Great. that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much and I'll turn it back if any council members wanted to make remarks, then we'll go to the council attorney, Ms. Ledoux. Ms. Right, council member Rice. Well, thank you very much. I'm gonna try and be brief. You know, the pandemic has shifted our focus as we realized how much we needed to stay connected. 
And that affected everything from work to school to community uh, to medicine to everything that we needed. And we realized how important it was. Now, many of you know I'm the co-chair of the National uh, Broadband Task Force with the National Association of Counties. And so I work on this daily in terms of policies that have limited the potential for residents throughout this country uh, to remain connected to broadband access. And it's been exacerbated by COVID. And certainly what we've seen through this is that uh, mobile technology has been able to salvage uh, some connectivity for some of our most vulnerable residents, uh, not just here in Montgomery County, not just here in the state of Maryland, but all across this country. And I continue to hear the stories and see the challenges that families face. But the reality is this, and many of you know this, many of you who have, who have unfortunately had to be remote while you're trying to connect to a Zoom and realize that your phone call capacity was not enough to handle uh, that one Zoom call and you either got disconnected, you ended up freezing, whatever the case may be. Well, imagine if you now have a family who's using that one connection, not just you, not just your one Zoom call, but everything else. And one's trying to do homework while another child is doing something else in a Zoom a conference with a teacher. And then you're trying to get online and then you have maybe a parent who lives with you who's also trying to, te to get telemedicine help uh, with their doctor. These aren't rarities. These are our norm now. These are the things that our families experience on a daily basis. These are things that I saw uh, on a daily basis uh, as a council member. Many of you know just recently um, to where we were in the middle of a very important hearing and I couldn't even, and I had to keep trying to reconnect and reconnect. Council president knows all too well. Uh, Mr. Chair of our HHS knows all too well in my connectivity issues because I live in a more rural area of Montgomery County now in Darnstown where we don't have that same signal access. These things are real. And I hope that folks realize that this is about trying to establish a connection and make sure that folks have access uh, to something that is so important to them and will continue to leave them behind if we don't develop it. In the coming years, let me just close with this. 5G wireless internet stands to remake the online world. Um, those speeds that are gonna be coming with 5G are gonna to help to address some of the inequities that will continue to exist even when we have the recommendations that we move forward with, with the broadband task force and the great work that the Biden administration and Congress have passed in terms of broadband infrastructure improvements. The reality is, is that when you look at middle mile and last mile in some of our rural areas, it is not economically conducive even with tons of grant funding to be able to get connectivity to those homes. So what do we do? What do we do in those situations to ensure that those farmers who are trying to run e-commerce and also trying to support their families and make sure that their families are connected to be able to log on to the internet and do all of the things that they need to for their children in terms of research or other members of the family who want to remain connected? What do they do? Do we tell them, sorry, we just don't have a solution for you? Or do we step up and say, yes, there is something else that we can do to provide you the type of service that we know is commensurate with remaining connected to the digital world. This is about equity. This is truly about equity, not about racial equity, digital equity. And so it really is important for us to make sure that we push this forward, uh, that we get folks to understand why this is important. Uh, and this isn't some pie in the sky ideology. This is something that is before us right now. And if we don't move and we don't ensure uh, that our residents have that option for connectivity, we are doing a disservice to our residents by leaving them behind and further creating a larger digital divide. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President Albernoz. Thanks, I'll be concise because it's, uh, it's late. Um, so, uh, this, has, this issue has been debated extensively by the previous council and this council as well. And I do put a tremendous amount of faith in our federal agencies. It's why I was not at all reluctant to get my vaccination when it was made available, because I had faith that the FDA and the systems that we currently have in place um, have conducted their own extensive research on a variety of issues that impact us. 
there was a digital divide prior to the pandemic that was under the surface, not really something that we focused as much and attention as we should have on. But what has transpired over this last year and a half has made infinitely clear that the technology solutions that are emerging and becoming available by the second are something that our residents deserve and should demand. I've, this will be the third time I've referenced my fire and rescue ride along last night. I encourage all of you guys to do it because it left a tremendous impression on me. But I mentioned earlier this morning during our public health uh, discussion that um, our, our emergency rooms are filling up uh, and, and it's becoming a huge problem. Uh, it's, it's referred to as code yellow when our six hospitals um, no longer have emergency room beds. One of the solutions of that is technology. Our fire and rescue squad and the EMTs have been outfitted with these brand new devices. And they've also been given a new device that's literally, they've just had access to in the last two weeks. That's literally, it's a sonogram that you can utilize to check someone's artery and whether there is blockage or not to determine whether or not somebody's having a heart attack or a stroke. That can be done from the ambulance prior to them going to the emergency room. It can save lives, but it requires a very strong Wi-Fi access and internet connectivity in order for them to be able to then transport and communicate that information to the emergency rooms. So this has very real applications. And I think if we're going to have a fighting chance to address some of the issues that are just coming into focus now from the pandemic with regards to the academic divide, the, the health and wellness divide, we need tools at, at our disposal to, to be able to address those issues. And it's not fair that somebody who can afford an, an extended Wi-Fi connection within their home, which is what we had to do in ours, uh, in order to accommodate our four kids who are all Zooming at the same time, um, it, it's not fair that other families who may not have the means or the ability for by which to do that can't do that themselves. And it does have real life implications as we're all out on the road, uh, you know, traveling to different places around the county. The train has left the building <laughs> with regards to this technology. It's here, it's here to stay, and it's growing by the minute. Uh, and I think it's important for us as a community to stay in front of it. I appreciate and respect the correspondence I've received on this issue, but it's become clear to me that this is something that we have to move forward. Taking into account some of the legitimate concerns that have been raised with our municipalities and others, but I really commend the Fed Committee uh, and, and you, Ms. Nadu, uh, for your tremendous work, um, which I think has been outstanding in this in this case. and and. I'm sure there's a lot more to come from you. Um, so thank you uh, to our Fed Committee Chair and the Fed Committee members. I look forward to the robust discussion, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm even more in favor of this now than I was when I initially co-sponsored it two years ago uh, for all the reasons and everything that's transpired over this last year and a half. Thank you. Council Member Nevado. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so, um... First, I want to thank the Fed Committee for their work, Ms. Nadu, for all the analysis and all the community members that have chimed in. Um, there's no doubt that this issue has a long history as it was described. And I think it was appropriate for the council to take a look at all the different points of view, angles, all the different information that we received. Um, there are a number of issues that I have been you know, reflecting on as well. Uh, no doubt the pandemic. There were many things that we knew we had to work towards. There were many projections that we had made regarding possible uh, shifts that we needed to, to make. Uh, things like telecommuting or online um, education and things like that were just on paper. And then literally within 24 hours, we went from that to just doing it. Uh, and uh, for a year and a half, uh, this is all we've done. And we've just been thrown into this uh, evolution of sorts that we thought we were gonna have more time to adapt. So I think that has been a, a complete game changer. I mean, absolutely. The other issue is this whole notion of equity that I keep hearing about. And we've looked at it from the perspective of digital the digital divide, but of course, all our work on racial equity and social justice and then with the pandemic, I think it made, also made me reflect a lot on our responsibility to provide opportunities for all. 
this county needs a boost. And the ones that will suffer the most if we are not serious about providing opportunities and access to opportunities will undoubtedly be a lot of our low-income residents, which many of them are people of color. We know that. And so when we think about where we are positioned regionally, the fact that our counterparts have already moved forward with different uh, proposals and uh, are already uh, offering this in our head, uh, that gives me pause as well, because it's not the only metric by which we need to um, think through how we're positioning the county in terms of prosperity and access to opportunities, meaning jobs. How are we positioning our young people to access these uh, opportunities as well and the jobs of today and tomorrow? Uh, and so, again, I, I think that this is a totally different moment in time. We've used the word meet the moment. I think that if Montgomery County wants to meet the moment, uh, then th this is one of those elements that we need to address. And um, here we are, a year and a half of dealing with all of this. I myself here and you know, still working from home, young adult daughters working from home husband, uh, understanding uh, what we have heard regarding the uh, digital divide, the learning loss that has occurred because many of our families didn't have access. I mean, we have so many different stories. Like agricultural reserves saying we have not been able to participate remotely on some very important uh, policy uh, proposals because of lack of access. I mean, there's just, the list goes on and on. And so I appreciate the work so far. I will be paying very close attention to, of course, all of the different elements of decision points. But I got to tell you, I, I do believe that, um, that we need to act. I, I really do. I think that we need to do whatever we can to position Montgomery County in a place where we are also competitive. We're in the game and we're not holding our residents and our constituents uh, behind. So thank you. And I look forward to, to the conversation. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I too thank the uh, Fed Committee for all their work. I, I have some great concerns about this legislation. And, and I certainly am somebody that uses my cell phone probably every minute of the day or in some form or, or some in some other way. And I, and I appreciate the, the concern for the digital divide. I really do. But I, the other day I, I met with some folks from the, from the industry itself. And I said, would you uh, 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 commit to putting in the, the uh, 5G network in the areas where they're not now, where, the, where we're having the digital divide now? Would you put it in the ag reserve first? Would you put it in the areas that are having the difficulties, the underserved and the, and the underprivileged areas first? And then go to the other areas if that's if that's uh, if this uh, legislation were to pass. And I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I think they basically said they'd get they get back to me that they that they you know they're going to go. And and obviously it's an industry that's for profit. And and I don't I don't fault anyone who who makes a profit. I mean I I was in I was in business and I and I understand that's how that's how you live. But it does concern me. I think they used the the uh, description that there was going to be a 90% at some point. And I don't know how fast that point is, but it was going to be a 90% uh, build out. And if I'm wrong on that, then please correct whoever, but please correct me. But the reality is the 90% sounds great. What happens about that 10%? Is it the same people that are not getting the service today? And we have to protect that. We just can't say 90% is good enough. We and, and to the point, well, we're, you know, everyone, everyone needs us. I, I we all need this. But the the reality is how fast are you gonna get it? Even if we said today, which we're not, said today that this legislation should go forward just as it's written or as it's amended, just as if we said that, when when would it actually be built? And when we're talking about having um uh Bell Towers everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. 
and and one of the questions that I had was was whether or not they could do something as an example in the ag reserve and not have it uh, every 20 feet or whatever whatever 30 feet or 60 feet whatever the the uh, the concern was at some point the the various uh, how close the poles were to be together has has changed over time so I, I have great concerns with this from day one I understand a that it's my understanding, and if it's wrong, please correct me, but it's my understanding that we really can't talk about the, the, uh, health, the health part of this. That, that uh, um, I, we heard today uh, from Council Member Reamer that, that some of the court cases were, were settled or uh, determined yesterday. And, and if, we, if we could certainly get a, an update on that from, from our staff, that, that whether or not there's anything else left, whether that really does finalize it, I, I would like to know that. But if we can't discuss the health, which bothers me greatly, by the way, because I would like to know whether the FCC could tell Dr. Fauci that he couldn't discuss it. I would like to know the fact that he didn't discuss it is one thing. Did he not discuss it because there's really not a health issue or did he not discuss it because he couldn't? There's a difference. And I'd like to know that answer. And I'd, I'd like to know, um, and it bothers me when a federal communications commission says you can't communicate, you can't talk about it. Well, I think you do need to be able to talk about it. And I think we need to get that information. And I would also like to know whether or not, when, and we've gotten some from, um, various uh, information on it, but I'd like to know whether there are any court cases pending where the Montgomery County is either directly involved or indirectly involved or, or, or other other uh, counties and other municipalities are directly involved or not. So if we could get that information, please. And I did want to point out that there's been a lot of confusion on this. And in some cases, we've gotten, you know, the email, the same email with, with various people's names on the bottom from everywhere, from, from places inside Montgomery County, from places outside of Montgomery County and, and other states as well. Um, but the municipalities that have zoning authority are not a part of 1907. And I think that has to be very, that has to be noted. We've gotten emails from people in, in, in Rockville and Gaithersburg and, and Poolsville and other places that say, you know, I don't want 1907. Now they can have an opinion about 1907, not in front of their own home, but if they're talking about in front of their own home, if they're in the municipalities, and there's seven of them, I believe, in Montgomery County that have their own zoning authority, they are not a part of 1907. So I, 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 I could go one and I will for at another time, but I would like to know that information as we go along. And as I say, bottom line is I'm very concerned and I believe that we need to get ourselves to a better place. But the question is, is this the better place? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Nvu. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, council members. Um, afternoon. To start, because I know that there are a lot of different questions and issues to go through, I'm going to start with just an overview um, of how I'm going to go through the packet. Um, I'm going to try to start with the lighter issues and then move on to the more in depth, controversial ones. Um, and it's mostly going to follow the order that the packet goes in. And then I promise I will pause after each section um, so that there can be discussions and sections on that. Um, sorry, go ahead. Just, sorry, um, if we could go, I think colleagues to like 4.30 on this, we're way behind and then and then get to the, uh, the other legislative business because I know we're gonna be coming back to all this at length. Is that right to everybody? Every, no protest. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Hindu. Absolutely. Uh, and so let's see. So first I'll go through what is 5G and then why the county needs the CTA because so many of the council members have talked about the policy reasons. I'm gonna focus more on those legal reasons um, and then the federal guidelines. And then I will go through what the Fed committee did. Um, we do have several um, attendees here. Um, they're here for any sort of technical questions. I'm guessing we might not get to any of those today since we are gonna have due to the limited time today there's gonna be an additional work session on July 13th. So this is definitely not gonna be the last time that we go through this. Um, so, uh, so as we've gone over, this ZTA was first introduced in October, 2019, but obviously the small cell antenna issue really predates that. 
So the way 5G works is there are lower powered antennas that serve a smaller area with higher data volumes and they're designed to operate at higher frequencies. Um, so unlike the giant macro 100 foot towers, we need more antennas and they have to be spaced closer together and they are closer to the ground. Typically, these antennas are placed on street light and utility poles with street lights usually needing to be replaced in order to accommodate the additional height and weight of those antennas. So the legal reasons are the why now of this CTA is in 2018, the FCC did issue an order that prohibits local governments from prohibiting deployment. So that's a big factor here because it says if they look at Montgomery County's ordinance and find that we are prohibiting deployment, then that's a legal issue. Um, I know that there has been talk about whether a provider would sue or how rushed are we, but the truth is that there have already been a couple bills brought before the General Assembly about small cell antennas, and they have specifically called out Montgomery County for being restrictive. Now, none of those bills have gone forward, but they are something that is out there. So we're, I guess the easy way to say it is Montgomery County is sort of already on the radar for having more restrictive policies, as we saw from Council Member Reamer's overview of what other jurisdictions have done. So the federal guidelines have a few major parts. Uh, first, they place restriction on the fees that local governments can charge for access to the right of way, um, as well as outlining the aesthetic requirements that can be imposed on carriers. Uh, next, it prohibits local governments from prohibiting deployment, as I stated. Most importantly for that piece is it also has to happen within a certain amount of time. So this is what has been called the shot clock. It's 60 days for attachments on existing and then 90 days for new or replacement. Um, and that is a very big factor in why the ZTA is crafted the way it is. Um, and then lastly, there is also a piece of the FCC order about giving construction crews the authority to make the changes they need to to the polls. Uh, there was a Ninth Circuit appeal, um, as you just heard, uh, that was actually appealed to the Supreme Court, highest court in the land. They denied it, they're not gonna hear it. So that is the answer to, on the update of where we are in terms of waiting for the end of legal proceedings. Um, there is a case pending in a DC Circuit Court. Um, I believe they just had oral arguments a few months back. I can get an update. Um, after this on where exactly that is standing. We are not a party to that appeal, but that is something that is out there. Um, I know this is at the end of the packet, um, but I, I'm gonna do health effects and property values because those are two overarching issues that I know have come through a lot in the correspondence. Um, as far as the health effects, it, Congress has explicitly preempted us from considering radio frequency emissions. It came from the FCC order. There's a specific order from Congress. It's just not something that local jurisdictions are allowed to consider. I agree that is unfortunate in some ways, but that's the legal answer to why that's something that can't be a factor and why we draft the ZTA the way we do and the decisions that the council can make. Um, next up is property values. Um, this sort of touches onto the equity issues. Um, well, first I wanna say that we do not have an impact statement from OLO because the CTA was introduced in 2019 before that was a requirement. Um, asked, but as a follow-up, sorry. <laughs> we asked, but they were not able to do it. Just wanted to get that out there, yeah. Uh, so the property values, I, based on the research that I have done um, and that my predecessor did, there are some studies that say it decreases property values because they're unsightly. Others say it increases property values because there's more accessibility. And others say there's no effect at all. And a lot of those studies are about the macro towers, which are the 100 foot tall ones. So I just wanna put that up front as we consider more equity issues. Um, so I will pause there because now I'm about to get into what the Fed committee did. If there are any questions. Okay. So the Fed committee had three work sessions on this ZTA and there were basically six straw votes that were taken. The first is to reduce the setback for our limited use from 60 feet to 30 feet. The second is a modified conditional use process for all poles under the 30 foot setback. Third, a waiver and objection process for a height up to 50 feet where other limited use setback requirements are met. A waiver and objection process for all new poles. Uh, for notice in the waiver and objection process to be sent to all property owners, and associations within 300 feet. 
and for standing to also be limited to 300 feet. And then lastly, cold proliferation language um, that basically says a small cell, a small wireless facility shouldn't be located within 100 feet of a facility occupied or controlled by the same carrier. So that is the overview of what the Fed committee did. Um, and then if there's no questions on that, then I will go into each piece of that. Okay. So uh, starting with limited use. So from a basic zoning perspective, there's two types of uses in the CTA. There are limited uses and there are conditional uses. A limited use is for purely objective standards. An applicant wants, there's lots of these in the zoning code. So say you want an auto repair shop, a restaurant, a farm, whatever use it is. A limited use standard says, if you check these boxes, we make sure you checked all those boxes, you meet all the requirements, you get that use. You don't have to go to a hearing before a hearing examiner. And that is why there is no hearing for the limited use telecommunications towers because that's just not what happens in a limited use process. Uh, the second piece is the conditional use. So in the conditional use process, that's where you get that full review by planning. It's where you go to the hearing examiner, you have the full hearing, the public is there, whether there's anybody in objection or not, there's still a full hearing. So for the limited use standards, uh, there are design standards that conceal the enclosure. So just basic aesthetics, you know, you don't want to have a bright green antenna on a gray pole. Um, and they also don't allow exterior wiring. Uh, the second piece is the height, which is based on the width of the right of way. Uh, once you add that additional height, most of these are going to average to about 35 to 40 feet tall um, in the limited use. And so you're going to get plus six feet if the right of way is less than 65 feet wide, and then plus 15 feet if the right of way is more than 65 feet wide. And then the last piece is that the limited use setback is going to be 30 feet from buildings intended for human occupation. So in the ZTA as it was introduced, it was 60 feet. But in the Fed work sessions, looked at a lot of GIS analysis, heard back from providers, heard back from the community, looked at more GIS analysis. And if you look at the number of poles in the county, most of them, in fact, a little under half are past that 60 feet. So if the idea is we need these small cell antennas to go on utility poles and streetlight poles to increase service, you're not gonna get that with a 60 foot setback which is part of why it was reduced to 30 feet. And then again, looking at other jurisdictions in terms of those policy reasons, most of them have a limited use of 30 feet, if not 10 feet, if not no setback at all. Uh, so that was the reason for uh, limiting, for bringing the limited use standard down to 30 feet. Um, I'm gonna do conditional use and then I will pause just so we can see the difference between the two. So the conditional use will be triggered if the setback is gonna be less than 30 feet. The reason to provide at all for less than 30 feet is one, there are some pretty narrow streets in Montgomery County. Uh, there are neighborhoods that could end up being completely left out. Also provides an increase in the antennas and mirrors neighboring jurisdictions. I should note for this piece, it is still only going to be on pre-existing or replacement poles that conditional use. And a few things have to happen in the conditional use process in order to make this work. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the federal guidelines are 90 day shot clock. The typical, typical, the typical conditional use process, as I'm sure you've heard in many other ZTAs that you bring to me, uh, takes a lot longer than that. It's anywhere from six months to a year to get that conditional use approved. Obviously much more than 90 days. So the way the conditional use process is gonna be shortened is a few things. First, planning board and planning staff are no longer gonna be required to make a recommendation. This does not mean that the hearing examiner is not allowed to talk to them. The hearing examiner can of course ask planning staff or planning board if they want some additional type of review, but it's no longer gonna be required. Next, the hearing examiner's findings are gonna be very limited. This again, dates back to the not being able to prohibit service. We can't go to the hearing examiner and then have the hearing examiner say, no, you can't have this poll because that is quite literally prohibiting service. So the hearing examiner is gonna see what the least visually intrusive location is. This is gonna be made a little easier by the fact that the applicant when they apply is gonna to have to provide at least one, hopefully more than one alternative location. So the hearing examiner will look at 
all of those, they'll have that full hearing and decide which location makes sense. They're going to, the hearing examiner can consider the use of screening, the use of color, existing tree coverage, all of those things can be considered by the hearing examiner during that conditional use process. The next thing to shorten it is allowing consolidated applications. If you're going to have one, an antenna put up every 150, 200 feet, it doesn't make sense to have seven hearings for one long street. So instead, all of those can be heard at the same time so that you know, we're not expecting the public to have to, if they're in opposition, to have to come to eight, eight different hearings, also makes things a bit easier on the hearing examiner. And then lastly, the modified conditional use process is going to eliminate the Board of Appeals. Typically, you go to the hearing examiner, then an applicant goes to the Board of Appeals, and then they go to circuit court. With the modified conditional use process, because going to the Board of Appeals would push us past the shot clock, you're going to go straight to circuit court if you disagree with the hearing examiner's decision, which keeps us safe because the, while the Board of Appeals is in the shot clock, the circuit court, of course, is not. Um, and then an additional change in the modified conditional use process is that notice is only going to be sent to those within 300 feet. Usually with conditional use, it's within a half mile. You can't see a 50 foot pole from a half mile away. So that's why it's been reduced to 30 feet. Uh, also a sign post on the property. So with 10 minutes left, that is the most of what the Fed committee did. And I can, I'll probably save waiver and objection for next time in case there's discussion and question on those two pieces. Unless Council President Hooker, you want me to just run through it all. Um, questions from colleagues? Councilmember Raymer. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, emphasize the part of the proposal when an installation would be closer than 30 feet to an occupied building, the folks who live there, if they want to object, they can go and have their day. And they can say, the proposed location is not the least obtrusive location. There is a better location nearby. There's a pole over there, not in front of anybody's house, or there's a pole over there at the corner. And that location would be less obtrusive. I think that is a very solid ground to put our residents on to make a claim that is less, uh, it, that, that is winnable, but within a constraint of reality that you can't just litigate whether wireless is needed. A lot of the folks who want to fight do not believe they need, we need wireless, that they need wireless in their neighborhood. That's what they want to litigate. They want to say, we don't need more coverage here. We can't do that. I mean, the federal government doesn't really provide for that, but it's also unnecessary. And if you allow for that, there's no way you meet the federal requirement. So let's give a meaningful way to push for a difference, not here, over there. It fits within the shot clock. It, you know, it, it gives a reason to be involved for those who do. And it, you know, it, it kind of ties together. So the Insulation that's further than 30 feet is by right. Closer than 30 feet, people can object and they can have they can be heard. That that that's our committee recommendation. So the third piece is the waiver and objection process. So some of you might be familiar with this is actually how the ADUs, the accessory dwelling units, work. The main difference here is going to be. If there's no objection, there doesn't need to be a hearing. So the waiver objection process is triggered in two instances. First, if an applicant or provider wants that poll to go up to 50 feet. The reason this was included and that the Fed committee considered this is the FCC actually defines a small cell antenna as under 50 feet. So it was very likely that if a provider said, I want a small cell antenna that's 48 feet, and I'm not allowed to have it, so Montgomery County has prohibited service. So this allows an avenue to go up the few feet in height. Uh, and then the second piece is for any new poles. So this is based on conversations with the TAC committee and the executive, This there aren't too many of these. These tend to be a lot more rare, uh, but we still need to account for that possibility, particularly in neighborhoods where there might not be a lot of street lights, uh, like a lot, I know a lot of you have mentioned places like the Ag Reserve, more rural areas. So the way the process is gonna work is if all other conditions are met, uh, minus that height or that it's a whole new pole, 
then the applicant will apply for a waiver. Once that waiver is applied for, notice is gonna go out to the, all those interested parties within 300 feet. If somebody with, who got that notice wants to file an objection, they can do that. As soon as they file that objection, it triggers a hearing. So they'll have a hearing before the hearing examiner that'll look at similar standards they look at for the conditional use process. If there's no objection, meaning no one has an issue with that poll, then there's no need for a hearing and the hearing examiner can grant that outright. Um, I'm gonna pause here because there were actually two amendments proposed after the Fed committee work session. So I wanna present them separately. Um, the first is from council member Friedson, uh, which would not allow a new poll if there's a usable tower within 150 feet. If you already have a street light there, there's no reason to construct a whole new one. So that's council member Friedson's amendment. And then the next is council member Reamer's amendment which will mirror the limited use standards for height. Since it's a new poll, we don't have an existing height already. So it has to be the same height as the nearest existing poll. And then you can get that additional six or 15 feet. Um, and I will actually, I guess, turn it over to Council Member Reamers and, Reamer and Friedson if they wanna talk about their amendments. I'd suggest we not get into them. They're rather technical. And I think folks can read them you know, in the intervening time uh, between now and our, in our next session. Uh, but Council Member Friedson may. Yeah, I'll just quickly say uh, I agree with that. Happy to answer any questions uh, between now and the next meeting. This was a, an issue that we discussed at length during the committee, a lot of stakeholder uh, interest on this question of proliferation. It was one of the concerns from the municipalities that don't have zoning authority uh, about a concern related to proliferation. And so we looked at neighboring jurisdictions to see what others like Prince George's uh, have done to address this question of uh, the concern that there would be a poll everywhere, uh, you know, all over the neighborhood and will create uh, a concern. So we try to address that while following the, the broader uh, constraints that the committee was operating under with uh, standards that uh, Ms. Nindu noted earlier. And if, if I'm, I'm going to take a risk and try to characterize this accurately, uh, Ms. Nadu, but the amendment that I will be offering is basically intended to avoid something we hadn't anticipated in the drafting, which was that you would not be able to make it higher. They typically need extra room at the top of the pole for the antenna. And so we just want to make sure we're allowing for that. So uh, there will be a, what I would consider a technical amendment that uh, it, you know ensures that the replacement can get the extra height that it needs, given that everything that was on the pole still needs to be there and you've got to go above, you know, for the antenna. Um, so that will be in the packet for the next one uh, and certainly invite any comments on that, you know, from community or, you know, stakeholders in advance of that. And it, perhaps there's a better way to word it than the way it is now. Um, thanks. So okay. that is actually the overview of the entire ZTA. So next up is actually is going to be, I guess I have a list of commonly asked questions that I can go through. Um, first, to respond to Council Member Katz, um, it is true there are certain municipalities that are not bound by the Montgomery County Zoning Ordinance. That's been true since I believe 1928. So, um, and it's. Brookville, Poolsville, Laytonsville, Rockville, Barnesville, Gaithersburg, and Washington Grove. So if you're from that municipality and you're listening, this will not technically affect you. Um, there are, Tacoma Park and Kensington do have concurrent jurisdiction um, to enforce their own zoning laws, but in order to do that, they need two thirds approval from the planning board and then two thirds approval from this council. Um, so I wanna note that to answer the municipality's question. Um, Let's see. Uh, next, uh, another issue that's come up a lot is the tower committee. I know that the county executive sent over a memo this morning, um, so I understand if everyone hasn't had a chance to read it. Um, before the session, um, the next work session on this, I will attach it as an addendum and discuss it in a sort of extra paragraph um, onto my memo. Um, but to address the tower committee generally, because I know there's a lot of confusion on what they do, how it works, so the tower committee to sort of oversimplify, it doesn't hear public testimony. 
the meetings are open to the public, but there isn't actually any public testimony. And the reason that that's not as quite as bad as it sounds is what the Tower Committee does is they just provide technical recommendations. The actual decision-making authority is with DPS or with the hearing examiner. So uh, there's a whole group of stakeholders who look at all the technical aspects. They find the appropriate location. They try really hard to encourage co-location and they give that technical recommendation. And so that's before the hearing examiner or DPS, whichever the case may be, when deciding um, what to do there. I know there's been a lot of correspondence from the community about issues within the tower committee. Uh, the tower committee. Um, reading through that letter from the executive this morning, it sounds like that's something they're working on. I will note that's not the tower committee any issues with the tower committee that the council members want to address would be more appropriate in a separate bill because the tower committee is governed by a section of the county code, not by the zoning ordinance. It's the difference between a bill and a ZTA. Um, so I just want to go over that briefly. Um, next is the issue of inspections. There's been some claims that the ZTA gets rid of routine inspections. It does not, the ZTA is silent to routine inspections and there have never been routine inspections. So in that way, it's a bit of a misinterpretation. Um, DPS does do an inspection when a tower is completed. Um, it's part of that permitting process. And actually the provider usually actually has a third party engineer who also looks at that antenna. Um, if there is a complaint about an antenna or a tower being out of compliance, that also goes to DPS. Um, I spoke to them, they investigate it, they can issue a violation notice, which can get, if it's not fixed in 30 days, that gets followed by a citation. If it still doesn't get fixed, it goes to abatement, and then it goes to court. Um, so there is already a process in place for when these things are not in compliance, and the inspection happens right after it's built, but there aren't routine inspections like most of the uses in the zoning code. Um, and I believe unless there's other questions that covers most of what I wanted to go over today. Great. Thanks so much, Miss Indu. Very, very helpful to all of us, I know. Um, hey, Miss Miss Spielberg, Miss Herrera, thank, thank you for joining us. Uh, I haven't had a chance, we've been in council meeting all day as all of us have. So I, I know probably none of us have read the memo from the county executive. My understanding was you were gonna send over an, a bill um, with a different approach to this like a year ago, but why send a memo now, now that the committee's already acted on it? Um, I think there are, uh, hi, I'm Debbie Spielberg, a special assistant to the county executive. And um, I think there have been a variety of factors for a while. There was the lawsuit that was at the Ninth Circuit. And I would just say in an aside, there are other relevant lawsuits that are still pending. They're not the same issues, they're different issues, but that's for separate. So there's, um, and there was also the pandemic as well. And so, and there've been ongoing conversations to understand what might be possible, what makes sense given various decisions. There's also, as we all know, a change in the administration at the federal level and um, a possible changes with FCC, which currently has a vacant slot and will have a new appointment from the president. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we've just been working on it. We've been reviewing tower, um, as you do is right, tower committee changes would happen in the code, not in the zoning ordinance, but they're very much related. And we've been trying to go through that as well as look at revised franchise agreements and working on license agreement and um, related cost studies. Right. Okay. Well, th thanks for that. I know, I mean, you you and we have all been working through the pandemic. We haven't missed any meetings. Um, um, I'm not on the Fed committee, but I think all of us probably would have benefited from a memo like a year ago. Um, okay. Any comments from colleagues? But I'll de definitely read it. Um, anybody else? Oh, Council Councilmember Jawanda. Yeah, just just um, appreciate the presentation, uh, Ms. Nadu. Just before we come back, if you could just research the point about, I did see the ticker last night, late last night about the Supreme Court denying cert, you know, not taking up the, but if you could just lay that out for everybody, uh, that and any other legal challenges, that would be the status of those. That I think that would just be helpful as far as like a timeline. Um, I'm, you know, I think some of us are aware of different components of it. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you. All right. Uh, so a couple minutes past 4.30. Um, thanks to everybody for all your work on this. This is great. We'll come back to it on the uh, third, July 13th. 
A um, couple of housekeeping items. Madam Clerk, uh, I believe Council Member Jawanda would like to be recorded in the affirmative on the special and the supplemental appropriations and the resolution in item 10. Is that all correct, Council Member Jawanda? That, that is, you beat me to it. Thank you, Mr. President, yes. If I didn't bring it up, I knew I'd forget. Um, Madam Clerk, we good on that? Anybody? Okay, well, it's- We'll make sure that's reflected. It's recorded. Thank you, Ms. Michelson, great. Okay, and then also on item 15, I, I, I proposed we after the public hearing, we just heard um, concerns from Dr. Goldman and the commission um, and we postponed the action. Dr. Orland uh, correctly points out, this is a supplemental appropriation to the FY21 operating budget. We won't be meeting next week. If we don't take action today, it would have to be a supplemental appropriation to the FY22 budget. He suggests that the council approve the appropriation with the 20% match funded by the Mass Transit Fund rather than the Transportation Services Improvement Fund, which would address the concern of the uh, Commission on uh, uh, Residents with Disabilities um, and allow the the T and E committee to come back to the issue of accessible cabs uh, at our next opportunity. Is that correct, Mr. Dr. Orland? Yes, it is. And there's four hundred and eighteen thousand dollars left in the uh, pending reserve for a mass transit fund, and this would take up one hundred thirty-eight thousand of that. So there's there's enough um, fiscal capacity to do this. So personally, I don't mind moving forward under those terms, and I look forward to a vigorous T and E meeting on this because this has been an issue that hasn't gone away in several years and hasn't really been addressed of accessible cabs. Councilmember Glass, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I so you're absolutely right that the T and E committee we we've, we've talked about this a few different times, and and while I absolutely uh, understand the concern and frustration that Dr. Morgan shared. Uh, rightfully so. I do want to just say that from a, a fiscal perspective, uh, the, while the Mass Transit Fund, according to Dr. Orland now, has uh, a little more than $400,000 in it. Is that what you just said? Correct. Uh, the fund that we are diverting from has about $3 million sitting in it. And so the reality, I see Dr. Orland looking around. Uh, <laughs> is that correct or not? Uh, I'm not sure about the three. What is the $3 million, sir? I don't, don't understand. Uh, well, uh, so uh, uh, let me let me correct my my statement here. Okay. Uh, the fund, uh, which was originally going to be used to support this, um, isn't being used as it should, and that is the bigger systemic issue that President Hucker just referred to. Um, and so, uh, I think there is more capacity there, and rather than continue to dwindle and draw down on the the mass transit fund. We need to get the other fund up and running, and I, I just want to say that as a as a precaution, uh, not at all dismissing uh, and actually supporting Dr. Morgan's primary concern. Just trying to figure out how we address that concern best. Yeah, just I think we need a full review with DOT present. This, I mean, this issue initiated under the last council. Um, under Chairman Berliner's uh, leadership. And uh, it just hasn't really been addressed correctly, it seems like by DOT. So I think all of us would benefit well, to have them there to address it. Dr. The, the, the 30 second history on this uh, is that when the law was first passed, it was restricted to be used for uh, making more accessible cabs available. Right. But after a few years of experience with almost none of the money spent, the uh, county executive legate proposed that the, uh, the money be, uh, be able to use for anything that's related to senior and disabled transportation. The council approved that. So it is legally appropriate, the question, but the point that Dr. Morgan and Ms. Buddington are making is that it wasn't the original intent of right. the of the Uber and Lyft. And, and to the extent that you wanna do that, then you know, the, just leave the balance the way it is and and uh, deal with it later. All, all of that is you're still in agreement with the principle that we need to come back and yes. address the gap. Okay, Council Member Friedson, I think. Yeah, I was just asking, do we need to move the the change number one and number two? Um, agree with the decision here that it's a much broader issue that many of us have been talking about at the T and E committee. The moment I showed up to the council, it was an issue yep. on a number of uh, of areas that needs to be addressed. I appreciate your leadership uh, moving that forward. I also think that uh, we need better coordination and communication from the executive branch when there's an issue, uh, you know, things that come before us as non-controversial when they are controversial. I think we need to make sure that we're doing a better job of communicating. So I just wanted to 
uh, to, to note that getting memos the five minutes before a work session is supposed to start or uh, not being aware of uh, you know potential issues from our own commissions. Uh, these aren't outside uh, stakeholders. This, these are our own stakeholders who we convene in order to give us input on the policies that we are making and uh, we ought to know what they're uh, thinking and doing and, and ought to hear that. But I just wanted to see if there's a motion needed. I'm happy to put it forward if so. You just did. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Rice. Sorry, can you restate the motion, please? Um, the motion is to move the source of funds, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Orland, please, and, and Mr. President, but it's to move the source of funds uh, from what was proposed uh, to the mass transit fund, which uh, has been confirmed that it has sufficient financial resources in order to yeah, operate. Yeah, to be clear that the grant, 80% of it's gonna be provided by FTA. It's the twenty percent match. Yeah, yeah. It would the, be the would key be here with... is we don't want to leave money on the table. So right, we, it's right, the end right. of the fiscal year. There's a lot we need to work out on a much bigger issue. This is an opportunity to pay twenty, get eighty yeah. percent, uh, not leave money on the table, and move the broader issue forward with which the council president and the TNE committee are going to do, or or even delay the acceptance of it. Yes. Okay. So everybody understands. Everybody good. All those in favor, please raise your hands. The supplemental appropriation as amended passes. Great, thank you. Okay, that was item 15. Now we're uh, head to item 17, the action on confirmation of the county executive's appointees as assistant chief, Montgomery County Police Department Council, uh, Carmen Facciello, Darren Frank, and Mark Yamada. Let me call on the chair of the Public Safety Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I so move. Is there a second? Councilmember Rice. Terrific. All those in favor of the confirmation of these three gentlemen, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Wonderful. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you very much. Looking forward to continue work with you. Thank you very much, Council. Thank, Thank you, you, Council members. Greatly appreciated. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we can move on to legislative session day 16. We have uh, four bill introductions. The first is uh, expedited bill 2421 bond authorization stormwater management. Mr. Smith. Good afternoon, Council. Um, as always, these are the next two items. I'll just speak in for brevity. Uh, 18A and 18B are bond bills. Um, as always, the Council approves a CIP um, that includes bonds. 18A deals with the uh, stormwater management and our special limited obligation bonds and are secured by the water quality protection charge. And so the executive is requesting an increase of 34 million bonding authority. Um, and then the second one is for general obligation bonds. Um, both are scheduled for a public hearing and action following the public hearing on July 13th due to the, the market timing and able to, to take advantage of that. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, and Next is uh, Bill 2621. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Bill 2621, taxation payments in lieu of taxes, affordable housing amendments. Council Member Reamer, and then Council Member Friedson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Friedson, for your co-authorship on this legislation. Um, uh, this is really important bill, a uh, really important bill. This, um, what this does, when a nonprofit buys a housing complex, they maintain that building at a, at a high level of affordability indefinitely through their policies. And what they typically do is they come in always to the county and they negotiate a certain level of financial assistance from the county. What this bill does is it creates an entitlement to some share of the financing that a provider would get from the county. Uh, it is the property tax portion. And by knowing that that will always be there, whether it, it enables a provider to buy a building in a fast moving marketplace and know that a certain share of their financing is already covered. Um, and so rather than having to be in a situation of, I wanna buy a building and then I'm gonna come and try to negotiate the financing from the county or, or, you know, or other machinations they might have to go to, they can go to the bank and say, you know, this share of our financing is already locked in because it's, it's statutory and, you know, we need this share from you, the bank, and, and, you know, this leaves this small share 
it allows our nonprofit and mission-driven providers to move quickly in a fast-moving marketplace. Uh, I'm particularly hopeful that we'll see action with this in the Purple Line corridor where there's housing that needs to be put under public or mission-driven control uh, to preserve long-term affordability and support redevelopment. Uh, but of course, it's countywide and there are opportunities all across the county. So uh, we will, this is a additional piece of a big housing agenda that we've been working on at Fed, including the WMATA incentive, including the HOC construction fund, uh, adding funding to HIF, ADUs, uh, the list goes on. Um, but uh, this is a critical piece for our nonprofit sector and I look forward to taking it up at committee. Uh, and thanks again, Councilmember Friedson. Councilmember Friedson. Uh, thank you. Thanks to uh, Chair Reamer. We've been working on this for uh, over two years now. In fact, there was a Fed committee session talking about uh, the broader issue of pilots uh, months before the pandemic began, uh, almost two years ago. We, my office had been working on it. Uh, prior to that, the, the first stage of this was we were able to work out uh, a pilot deal uh, with HOC because they are our designated public housing provider. We didn't need legislation to have uh, that done. That had uh, been the practice for many, many years. It, it no longer was uh, an automatic entitlement. It added a lot of uncertainty and uh, created some challenges. We were able to uh, reestablish that by bringing all the stakeholders together. And then this is the next iteration uh, of it is to uh, you know effectively uh, treat our affordable housing provider uh, uh, partners in the community, most of whom are uh, you know nonprofits that all of us work with a lot, uh, and and provide them with a similar level of stability uh, and certainty and uh, these funds to be able to move the deals forward as uh, Chair Reamer uh, just noted. Uh, it's part of the all hands on deck approach that this council uh, has really. Uh, taking the leadership on when it comes to affordable housing. We aren't going to meet the needs just by uh, county government alone. We need our partners to be uh, building uh, affordable housing units, to be uh, protecting uh, existing uh, market rate affordable uh, housing units. Uh, this pilot is one additional tool uh, in the toolkit. I think it'll be significant. And I do think it dovetails nicely with the WMATA pilot uh, regulations that we just approved uh, earlier today, it just shows that we are attacking this affordable housing crisis uh, at a number of levels and look forward to uh, discussion and appreciate the fact that we have had uh, a lot of uh, support and coordination with the executive branch uh, on this and uh, look forward to moving it forward uh, to be able to uh, address the uh, housing crisis. Terrific. Um, any other comments on that? Okay, next is item D, expedited bill 2721, Wheaton Regional Headquarters, lease approval. Uh, let me recognize, unless the district council member wants, has any comments on this, recognize. Uh, attorney. No, I think this just goes straight to council, so Great. yeah. Done, the hour is late. Okay, call of bills for final reading. Item 19, item A is expedited bill 1221, personnel, employees, retirement system, retirement savings plan, group trust amendments. Let me recognize the GO chair, council member Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. This uh, particular uh, bill, uh, we had one speaker in the public hearing, Ms. Linda Herman. Uh, and then now uh, we also had a work session is really primarily intended to amend the county uh, retirement plans to conform to recent changes in the Internal Revenue Code. The bill would increase the age for a required minimum distribution of benefits from 70 and a half to 72, change the timing for distributions to certain beneficiaries and permit the suspension of a required minimum distribution for 2020 to conform to federal law. The bill would also clarify the process for sending unclaimed distributions to the state and authorize the Board of Investment Trustees to provide for a new investment option for defined benefit contributions that would be based on the investment returns. Apologize for the defined benefit trust and returns. Um, OMB has concluded that they would have minimal uh, to no impact on county revenues and expenditures, and also no significant economic impacts on either private organizations or residents in the county, and minimal impact on racial equity and social justice in the county because it would impact all eligible county employees relatively the same, regardless of race and ethnicity. In other words, this is something that we needed to do in order to conform to recent changes 
in the IRS code, and it was a three to zero to support the bill as introduced. Terrific. Madam Clerk, do you mind calling the roll? Mr. Glass. Yes. Mr. Glass, vote yes. Mr. Tawando? Yes. Mr. Tawando, vote yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer, vote yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz, vote yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro, vote yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice, vote yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson, vote yes. Mr. Albernoz? Yes. Mr. Albanos, vote yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker, vote yes. Bill is approved. Thank you. Okay, next item B is expedited bill 1321, streets and roads, permit to obstruct right, public rights of way and franchising amendments. Uh, we had a very vigorous and interesting, despite the title of the bill, very interesting di discussion of this in the uh, Transportation and Environment Committee. Uh, Ms. McCartney-Green, are you with us? Do you want to describe the bill? Since you did great work on that packet. I can. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Uh, real briefly, because I know that the hour is late. Um, essentially, what this bill would do was expand DPS's authority to allow a property owner to apply for a permit um, for specific reasons. Uh, if it's going to um, be an accessory for residential use, such as an electric vehicle charging device, a private storm drain, sub pumps, rain, a roof drain as well. Um, and so the importance of this is that right now the county code requires uh, the homeowner to apply for a franchise because it is a permanent, permanent obstruction to a right of way. Um, in this case, uh, this bill would allow the uh, property owner to um, apply directly to DPS for a permit. DPS has robust standards regarding its electric, electric vehicle charging guidelines and what it's allowed. Um, it's not automatic. They would have to apply through a process um, as an applicant um, and once reviewed, be approved for that. Um, as you mentioned, we had a very robust discussion. Um, we have colleagues from uh, DOT and uh, DPS, uh, Linda Kowalski, uh, Atik Panshuri, and I apologize if I say that incorrectly, and Marcella uh, Cordova as well, if the uh, council members had more questions or needed more details concerning the bill. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? It's a good bill. Okay, Madam Clerk, do you mind calling the roll, please? Mr. Glass. Yes. Mr. Glass, vote yes. Mr. Tawando. Yes. Mr. Tawando, vote yes. Mr. Reamer. Yes. Mr. Reamer, vote yes. Mr. Katz. Yes. Mr. Katz, vote yes. Mr. Navarro. Yes. Mr. Navarro, vote yes. Mr. Rice. Yes. Mr. Rice, vote yes. Mr. Friedson. Yes. Mr. Friedson, vote yes. Mr. Albernoz. Yes. Mr. Albernoz, vote yes. Mr. Hucker. Yes. Mr. Hucker, vote yes. Bill passes. Terrific. Thank you. Um, item C is expedited bill 2221, eating and drinking establishments, itinerant food service facilities, amendments. This bill did not go to committee. Let me call on the bill's lead sponsor, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I do have a uh, proposed amendment. Rather than use the term itinerant food service facility, it's, um, it's suggested that it be called a temporary uh, food service facility. Uh, it would put us in in, uh, uh, in sync with what the state is doing now. So with that, I propose that amendment that we change the word itinerant to the word temporary food service facility. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Freeds and seconds. Great. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Great. Okay. All those in favor of the bill as amended, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Glass. Yes. Mr. Glass, vote yes. Mr. Tawando? Yes. Mr. Tawando, vote yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer, vote yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz, vote yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro, vote yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice, vote yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson, vote yes. Mr. Albernoz? Yes. Mr. Albernoz, vote yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker, vote yes. Bill passes. Terrific. Okay. Item D is uh, expedited bill 2321 special, special capital improvements project, um, full upgrade of existing recycling center complex. Um, Mr. Levchenko, are you with us? There you are, okay. Yes, um, yours. This, uh, the county charter and county code require uh, capital projects uh, that exceed a certain amount to um, be individually authorized by law. Uh, and we do have one project this year, the full upgrade of existing recycling center complex, which the council approved as an amendment as 
as part of the amendment packages that it looked at as this uh, recent budget year. Uh, that project came out as a total of about $19.5 million. The threshold, uh, which is updated each year uh, by the executive branch, uh, the FY22 threshold is $18.2 million. So this project exceeds the threshold and therefore has to be uh, specifically authorized through this special projects legislation. Uh, so what you have before you is a very simple bill that uh, acknowledges that this project is allowed to move forward, basically. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Great. Exciting proposal. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk, do you mind calling the roll, please? I believe a motion is needed first. Oh, beg your pardon. Is there a motion? I'll move. We don't have a committee recommendation. That's right. Councilmember Glass moves. Councilmember Katz seconds. Madam Clerk, it's all yours. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Bill passes. Thank you. And then final bill is uh, expedited bill 5020, landlord-tenant relations, fire safety removal of mercury service regulators. Um, I'll call on the chair of the Fed Committee in a second. I'll, I'll just um, mention we're approaching the fifth anniversary of the fatal explosion in Long Branch. And um, I still have a candle in my office from the first annual memorial service for the victims of Flower Branch. And today, uh, I'm glad we're going to be able to do right by them and the survivors of the tragedy to make sure we can do what we can within our authority to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, it took far too long to receive the federal report on the cause of that fatal explosion. We don't have authority over utilities, but this bill was actually suggested by uh, Washington Gas staff to fill a data gap that was preventing them from replacing these dangerous regulators. It uses our existing authority over landlords to require them to report the hundreds of mercury regulators that are still out there tonight, um, still in our buildings, and it requires DHCA to report them to Washington Gas for replacement. So um, grateful to all my colleagues who worked on this on the Fed Committee, grateful to all the co-sponsors. Um, Council Member Reamer, Chairman Reamer. Thank you. Uh, good bill. Appreciate your taking the initiative to introduce it. Uh, you know, it, acknowledge it's a little hemmed in by state law and state processes, but we did, uh, you know, we, we did what we could here. Um, you know, we focused the requirement on property owners providing information to DHCA and, uh, and also to uh, WSSC, uh, Washington Gas. Um, and uh, in so doing, you know, create a body of information that can better promote accountability and oversight. And uh, we had to work through a lot of different, you know, challenges legally. Uh, but I think we came out with um, something that hopefully is workable. So, uh, you know, the committee recommends the bill with amendments and uh, we could certainly turn to council staff to walk through uh, at a high level, um, you know, what the provisions are, or uh, we could even say, if everyone's read the packet and they really like it, we can go ahead and vote. <laughs> but it's a, uh, you know, it's it's all there. So um, why don't I ask Christine if you'll just give us a uh, a breezy run through, and uh, if if there are questions, then we can delve further into uh, any particular aspects of the legislation. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. President and Council Members. Um, as the chair stated, expedited bill 5020 uh, was considered very thoroughly and there was a lot of robust discussion during uh, over the course of three different work sessions where we had participation from Washington Gas, from AOBA, um, from DHCA, um, a, a, an array of stakeholders. And we do have with us today um, Director Nagam and others from DHCA, should there be um, additional questions, just to provide a brief overview of the recommendations um, of the Fed committee. The committee voted three to zero to recommend enactment of the bill with amendments to clarify the scope of a landlord's responsibility to determine if an indoor mercury service regulator is present. Um, in summary, the landlord is required to 
take a photograph of what the landlord believes to be the mercury service regulator. And then there's a helpful process on the Washington Gas website through which they submit the photo to Washington Gas, have it verified whether it contains mercury. And if it does, it facilitates the scheduling of the replacement. Um, the additional amendments were to require notifications to tenants once mercury service regulators are replaced. There were some technical amendments, including changing the word remove to replace throughout the bill. Um, there were some amendments to clarify that tenants may not remove or interfere with mercury service regulators. And then in terms of the applicability of the bill, after a lot of discussion, uh, with the stakeholders, the Fed committee decided to limit the applicability of the bill to non-condominium multifamily dwellings built before 1968, since buildings, uh, according to Washington Gas, built thereafter would be extremely unlikely to have the uh, the mercury the mercury service regulators. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Mr. Council President, you have a committee recommendation uh, before the body. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Madam Clerk, do you mind calling the roll? Mr. Glass. Yes. Mr. Glass, vote yes. Mr. Tawando. Yep. Mr. Tawando, vote yes. Mr. Reamer. Yep. Mr. Reamer, vote yes. Mr. Katz. Yes. Mr. Katz, vote yes. Mr. Navarro. Yes. Mr. Navarro, vote yes. Mr. Rice. Yes. Mr. Rice, vote yes. Mr. Friedson. Yes. Mr. Friedson, vote yes. Mr. Albernoz. Yes. Mr. Alvinos votes yes. Mr. Hucker. Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Bill passes. All right. Good day's work, everybody. Thank you uh, for all your hard work. I'll see you in two hours for the Thrive Committee hearing.